Okay, um, so we're gonna call the meeting to order. I'm just gonna say right now, I think the meeting's gonna end at 9.30. Yes, we can do it. Yeah. Okay, well that's, that's the goal cool team. Nine, yes, please do. Okay, that's based on nothing. So well, don't be offended if I walk out during somebody's <laughs> council report at 10 o'clock. Okay. So do you want me to time council members as well as uh, You probably should, you probably should. Okay, uh, first thing is to review and approve the agenda, and I think we had um, a couple of changes. Um, uh, we're pulling one item off of the consent agenda, um, and Glenn, you had requested that. I mean, we can just say that now, I suppose. Yeah. Um, which one did you want to uh, pull? I'd like to pull the complete streets plan, item K, off of the consent agenda for discussion. Okay, and just looking at the uh, agenda that was over there, there was some item that I think we, oh, we no, it's already there. But we had added that from the, yeah, it's yeah. on this agenda, but it's just to note that we are adding a discussion of the East North Branch properties. Okay. Um, so, any other changes? Can we talk about the complete street item from the consent agenda right away? Sure. <coughs> Great. So, we'll take that up right just after that. So, without objection, we're going to consider the um, agenda approved. Um, so now it's time for general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on some matter that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would try to keep your comments to two minutes or less. <laughs> if you'd say your name and where you're from. I'm Gretchen Elias. I live out um, off of Elm Street, uh, across from the pool. And I'm here tonight because I wanted to share some thoughts on transportation um, in, in and around Montpelier. And specifically, I'd like the council to consider charging some entity, some city department or committee or whatever the appropriate body is with looking at our transportation system and priorities and modes uh, comprehensively as a, as a system. And, um, I wanted to say a couple of things about why um, I'm thinking that that's something that the city should be doing. Um, Transportation is a critical issue for so many of our city priorities. Uh, we're not going to achieve our net zero goals if we don't address transportation. Um, the parking issue downtown is going to involve transportation and of course that gets into economic development and making sure we keep the downtown thriving and enable people to live down there as well as work and shop down there. Uh, and transportation just gets at all of these things, so it's a really cross-cutting issue. And there's no one silver bullet. It's not like there's going to be one mode of transportation that's going to work for everyone or solve anything single-handedly. Um, and I think right now we seem to have a lot of momentum around this topic. I think that Montpelier Sustainable, the Sustainable Co um, Montpelier Coalition provided a great vision for what our downtown could look like. We have new projects coming on with the transit center and the garage, potentially that are gonna open up some new conversations for us and present us with some new choices. Um, and it seems like to maximize all of those new opportunities, we really wanna be able to look at transportation as a whole. Uh, and the final thing I'll say in terms of my own experience is that for me, uh, the circulator is a really important way that I can tr get around town without a car. And I learned in May that GMT is planning to cut essentially the parts of the circulator that allow for this commuting, the Elm Street portion and the up Freedom Drive portion. And that's in their next gen plan that has been worked on for several years now and it's been approved by their board. And I was really upset about that and concerned and I reached out to a whole bunch of folks. I kind of did this like scattershot approach. Everyone I could think of, city council, city staff, a whole bunch of different people on a whole bunch of different co committees related to transportation. And the answers I got gave me a, the sense that with, uh, with one exception, Donna, <laughs> um, nobody really knew the status of what GMT was planning. And was, there were even conversations within the city that were assuming that the circulator would continue to exist, exist in its present form. Um, and this plan had been going on for a long time. And I just think that that, that really um, brought my attention to the fact that there is an opportunity here to look at it more comprehensively and make sure we're connecting all the dots. Great. So thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. And, and just so you know, GMT is actually going to be here next week at our council meeting. Great. Thank you. I'm sure we're going to talk further about that in the near future. Uh, any other comments? 
Oh, yeah. <coughs> Just to add a piece, instead of waiting until my council report for this, the Montpelier Infrastructure C Transportation Committee, Gretchen, is going to be holding public hearings, uh, whether that's in January, February, but they're going now looking to pull together to have GMTA there, as well as a lot of riders and con consumers to have a real lively public discussion on their routes and on mini transit. I'd okay. like to be a part of that, so that's great. Okay, any other comments? I just very briefly, for the general business, is note this is our first meeting. We've had all the sound redone. There's now new speakers in the back and new cameras, so we're high def now, right? Is that? Um, all right. So you all wanted an upgraded room and you got it. Okay. All right, I'm going to assume that there's no other public comment unless somebody jumps up. Okay. Uh, all right, so moving on to the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? So moved. Second. And it, that's, we're assuming that's minus item K? Yes. And there was a second. Further discussion? I'll I just would uh, note I did not fully read item B, the agreement between City of Montpelier and Christ Episcopal Church, so I trust that it is, that I would agree with it, but I have not completely okay. read the, the agreement. Fair enough. Okay. <coughs> Uh, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. So moving on to the comp uh, complete streets plan. Um, yeah, go ahead. Can you take one to second? Yeah. So, folks like Larry at all, that year stuff just passed. <laughs> <laughs> anybody who's here on the consent agenda, that just, that all just happened. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming up from yeah. Pennsylvania. <laughs> you can always stay. Yeah, we, you're welcome to stay. We're happy to have you stay, but just so you know that it's nothing like a Wednesday night in my appeal. You're at the council meeting. Good times. All right, go ahead. Um, so tonight uh, is, oh, sorry, um, is the continuation of the, the presentation that was done um, in June by Stu Sirota, who was our um, consultant. Uh, from council planning and design. Can you speak into the mic, please? Yeah, I think the mic is. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. Um, so th this is the continuation of that. This is um, to adopt it. Um, I went back and listened to the comments you guys had made in, back in June, and we made a, a few minor changes. Um, specifically, one was to address um, Ashley's concern about parking. Um, the map in the in the plan is a draft. So then that way, um, it's not formalized. Every single street has to be this way. Those are some of those typology decisions are, will be policy decisions as we get closer. So this will be incorporated into the CIP process to say, OK, when, when we're going to be doing a, a project and we're looking out, um, we'll start doing the assessments then to say, well, what will we need to make it a complete street so that we have a complete network. And that's where we went with this, was to try to end up with a, a network that works so that you don't have um, you know bike lanes that end uh, uh, nowhere so that so this gets pretty close to it but there will be as as time goes on there will be discussions in the community in the neighborhoods um, uh, as as these plans are, are formalized question thank you Glenn did you have anything you want to um, I'll say Basically, my, my reason for pulling it for discussion is only that I, I think uh, it's important enough and, and I'm happy enough about it that I want to really mark our decision of it uh, on it. And I, I, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, as a car-free resident and, and as someone who has um, lived my whole life without uh, owning or driving many cars, not owning any cars, <coughs> it's really important to me uh, to see moves around transportation really broadly. As, as Gretchen was saying earlier, uh, I depend on alternative modes of transportation pretty much entirely. Uh, and I think Montpelier is doing a, a good job of um, allowing me to continue to do that. It's a great place for me to live as a walker. Uh, but I think that the, the complete streets plan, just as a, 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 a layout of all of the, the um, exist, existing conditions and where we 
should consider moving as we uh, change and repair streets. It's, it's really something that I'm, uh, I guess I wouldn't say I'm thrilled about it because it's not, it doesn't, it, it's not the kind of thing that excites me, but <laughs> I'm very, very happy about it. <laughs> uh, the end result, you will like it. Yeah. The end result, I, 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 I can't wait. I want all the streets to, to change right away tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and put them in really, the that's all I have to say about it. I just wanted to, to, to mark the, the occasion, which I think is a happy one. Further comments or questions? I think I would just use the opportunity to note that when the many members of the council went out to visit the cemetery um, last summer, spring, um, we all noted the lack of a sidewalk out to the cemetery and then the, um, the neighborhood beyond the cemetery. Um, and I don't, I think Complete Streets does a really nice job of, of prioritizing everybody. Um, but just flagged that one um, since we're discussing it as one that we all kind of thought about at that point. Mm -hmm. Further comments? Good. Okay. Anthony Monona, uh, live on Colonial Drive, a member of the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee. I just wanted to voice our support for this plan. Um, I think it will provide a blueprint for Department of Public Works when they're working on roads to incorporate complete streets into them and provide safe biking, walking, uh, infrastructure for all users of the road. Um, an important piece of the plan that I found is uh, section 3.5, which is traffic calming policy, and I think it's really important that we start to look at ways to um, improve um, or slow down traffic, make sure that safer uh, speeds. Um, it was really interesting reading about how, you know, the slower the speeds, the less uh, dangerous, you know, accidents may be. Um, and so it's, you know, just a really important plan, and I look forward to having uh, the implementation take place and having it be a blueprint for our city. Further comments? Go ahead, Don. Yes, just to mention that as Anthony serves on the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee, has spent a lot of time on this, as has Kevin, as has Corey, and I do appreciate the staff support. It's been a long process. It's been a long <laughs> a process. A very long process. But the end result is very good. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to assume that there's no further comments. No? Going once? Okay. Uh, motion? Move that we adopt the complete streets plan uh, that was identified as consent agenda item K. I'll well, second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank Very you. exciting. Happy All right. Uh, we have an appointment to the Central Vermont Internet Board as a, an alternate seat. And we have one applicant for one seat. And I know you're here. Would you like to address the council? You don't have to. I don't need to. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry, I wasn't sure if I should have said this before. I'm Richard Litauer. Um, I actually also applied for this board on Monday. Uh, the deadline was Tuesday. I see it's not in the minutes. I see my application isn't there. Unlikely I'll get it, and the other guy's a lot more experienced. <laughs> but just thought I should let you know that there's another person. So would like to do you want to, yeah, well, so we, yeah, we had an unexpected administrative outage this week, or the ah. person that gets those uh, okay. was out uh, with a medical issue unexpectedly, so it's yeah. probably in her inbox, and so that would make sense. We didn't get that. We're sorry. That's okay. That. That's why I'm here. That's, we, <laughs> so no worries. Fair enough. Yeah. 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 Also here for you know the rest of it. Just <laughs> like, yeah. Another f fun Wednesday night. Right? Please attend those meetings and yeah. get involved because I, I know I had I had a. a conflict last night. Um, I don't know how to resolve this, but seeing as how the other guy has 21 years worth of experience in Montpelier, you should probably just vote for him and then read an application <laughs> after if you like. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, Jack. I move that we uh, postpone consideration of this agenda to a future meetings, uh, items to a future meeting so that we can see uh, the application materials of both candidates. We do it next week. A second. We meet next week. Great. I guess that's a motion, uh, and it's been seconded. Further discussion? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Next time. Thanks. Next week. <laughs> all right. Moving right along. All right. We have a presentation from the Silver Maple Group. So welcome, Carrie. Hi. Hi. So I do have some handouts, so I'm going to go and bring these around. There's, uh, there's two, there's a larger one. 
So there have numbers on the upper right corner, so that's when we put them um, in order. And I should also say that this um, is also primarily about uh, City Park, so it's not purely about the, um, the Silver Maple um, concept. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Um, or it's a, maybe I'll wait the myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Silver Maple Group. Um, we've been work. We've been to, um, meeting for a little over a year, a little over a year and a quarter. Um, a group of uh, primarily over 55 who are looking to be able to build a small um, over 55 community in Montpelier. Um, so I handed out this survey map because um, we've looked at a lot of locations and we feel that this location is is probably the best um, in Montpelier. Obviously, there are a lot of primarily terrain issues where we have challenges when it comes to anything that's relatively flat. Um, <clears throat> so that is a survey map that the property owner, which is Fecto Homes, um, gave me, and he's fully aware that this is going to be made public. So um, this is a 72-acre parcel. Um, the Silver Maple Group is not looking for any much more than maybe 15 acres. Um, and probably even less than that. <clears throat> so it was, I would propose that this be a um, city park, the balance. So it would be like 55 to 57 acres. Um, I met with the um, Parks and Recreation Commission and they thought it was a great idea to have a park on that part of town which does not have any access to city parks in that vicinity. Um, it also has access to 302, which would mean access to the bike path. So I um, wanted to just kind of explain where we're looking. So under number two, which is a natural resources map, um, that is a border of the property. There is some dispute over a section to the left, in a, like a diagonal there. It's already deeded to the city from the Stonewall Meadows Condo Association, but the dimensions are in the process of being surveyed to identify exactly where that is. <clears throat> but it would not affect the total number of acres. So that is a, um, I just found this one <clears throat> through their website and I highlighted around the corner the edges of it so you could see actually where it extends. Currently it's being used as walking paths and used by the neighbors and local. But it's on the market and the Fectos had said, well, <clears throat> if um, somebody comes up with a million bucks and they want to build one house, we're going to sell it. So that's kind of what we're up against. Um, we are looking to build a small community, as you can see on number three. <clears throat> um, we've been working with Jay Ansel for quite some time and he was kind enough to do um, a drawing, so I have a larger one. Which is, which is this, and I can tell. So we're really looking at a very <coughs> small part of this. So this is only a section of that map, on the natural resources map. So it's ideal because not only do you have green space and recreation, but also have housing. And it's a very small portion of that, but I can this there. You can just <coughs> leave it over on the side. Put there, right like prop that. it on the table. Oh, okay. So we're looking at the, a 
Pawtucket neighborhood, which is very tightly clustered, small homes between 800 and 1,200 square feet that face a common green. And because there will be over 55 housing, there does have to be a road front around the perimeter just to kind of a drive so that people have access to their homes. <clears throat> um, so there is this. And then what was originally proposed is number four here, and that is um, the uh, Capitol Heights, which was planned by the FECTOs. I believe they did get permitting at the time, and it was in 2007. But it was for 219 units, and that had a lot of pushback, um, which you can understand. So we're talking about maybe 32 units and not right off the bat. So the neighbors objected to it. There was a recession hit, and it just never happened. But you can see the access that they planned. The green uh, building on the upper left was uh, supposed to be uh, assisted living, and then independent living, and then private lots, and then condos and apartments. Um, so what we're talking about, and one reason for bringing this out into the public is just to dispel any rumors that, oh my God, there's going to be you know an 800 unit <laughs> development going up in our backyard. But having a city park uh, would be ideal for not just the neighborhood, but for us. And I also met with um, Ken Ballard, I guess it was, who's doing the feasibility study on the rec center, and mentioned to him, hey, you could put a rec center up there and you could have outdoor you know, soccer fields and whatever you like up that way. With 72 acres, you could do it. So the, um, can I ask you a question about that? Sure. It's quite sloped, isn't it? It's not really. It's not down below. What's the elevation change? Um, the elevation, it does go up along for 302. Okay. And then it goes up gradually. But they, we are, I've talked with Tom about uh, city resource, uh, um, infrastructure. And there is gravity fed sewer and there's um, pipes, water pipes, because that was actually planned because of the development. So if you look at that, um, natural resources map, the first one, you can see some clearings, and those clearings were designed so that the Isabel Circle would actually be a circle. Um, so there was a lot of planning that already went into it, um, and a lot of backup. So those, those two clearing sections are the most buildable, <coughs> and they are slightly sloped, but they're really not mm -hmm. terribly sloped. And I did meet with uh, Meredith about wetlands and there are no wetlands or no vernal pools and it's a it's a pretty good piece of property for building on but not all of it I mean it's walking trails now I mean it's it's really a nice um, piece of property for activities and recreation um, so just to kind of show you what pocket neighborhoods are about um, Ross Chapin is an architect nationally um, who kind of came up with this and you're thinking like your backyard is now your front yard and your cars come into your backyard and your front faces the green and you're right close to your neighbors. And the whole point of that is for socialization and aging in place. So many homes in the city, in the city just are not suitable um, for aging in place. <clears throat> it takes me two flights of stairs to get groceries upstairs. <laughs> so it is, it is challenging and also we can move out of that and get the younger families in. So that's why I wanted to give you a sample of what it would look like. And then the sample pocket neighborhood layouts. These are just <coughs> from online. There are various different iterations of, of that. <coughs> but it's, it's really a um, unique opportunity to increase the market rate housing in the city um, while at the same time creating a city park. And is Jeff here? Yes. That, hey. <laughs> So, so just going to back me up on this because he was at the meeting um, with the uh, Parks and Rec. Um, the last piece is the appraisal. So that um, Jim Fecto gave me, it shows what the appraisal was in 2015. Um, I spoke with Bruce <clears throat> and, um, you know, he, Colette, he agreed with this. I mean, it was fine with him to let it be known. Um, so we're seeing... Silver Maple, seven to eight acres. Um, there's two um, phases, as you can see on Jay's drawing, where the initial phase would be 
16 units, say, <clears throat> the second phase based upon who would be joining in would be another 16, but certainly no more than 32. Some of that can be intergenerational. Some of it could be, most of it would be over 55. Um, so we're really looking to see if the city has an interest in being able to work with us in creating a city park so that we don't need 72 acres, but the effectors will not subdivide. I've already been down that road. And, uh, so, and it's also, you don't want to lose the opportunity of being able to have a park in that part of town. Um, and the other is the income tax calculation. So, um, 32 homes that are valued at, say, hypothetically 250,000, when you get the municipal tax rate, um, of $2,500 times the tax rate, <clears throat> the income is $86,800 per year. Right now, the FECTO land is, entire piece is generating $2,700 a year. So you're talking about a repayment in about nine years on $800,000, assuming that Silver Maple property would be, say, $200. Um, this is, and I have the paperwork, so if <laughs> you I'm happy to send it to you. They're just my notes to help get me through. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so there are challenges. There's the survey that needs to happen. The good thing about the survey is that it's going to take some time to do that, and we're going to need the time to try to pull this together. Um, Jim Fecto said, okay, I'll give you a month, and I won't do anything with that land. Just see what you can do. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's the whole idea, but we can do what we can do. Um, and um, the, the financing and the timing. So I guess the other question that Jay put to me is that is there any chance of modifying the TIP district to include those 72 acres? I mean, I know it's up for Lynn Street, but you just say, well, throw it out. If you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions? You made reference to this being connected to 302, and I had looked at the maps previously mm -hmm. and couldn't figure out how it was connected to 302. There is a property that Jim Fecto owns that is right across, I, it's not the, it's kind of right in the middle on the right hand side there, and he said that he would grant a right of way through that property um, to connect to 302. Is that one with this road? Um, that, yes. That's what they had originally planned. Yeah, that's probably easier to, to look at it on that map, on the uh, Capitol Heights map. Four, it's number, number four. Number yeah, four. number four on the upper right, yeah. <clears throat> so just to be clear, you are asking that the city make an $800,000 investment in a piece of property in order to allow this development to go forward and to provide a city park. I just, uh, we didn't have any kind of introduction, <laughs> so I just want to lay all right, that, right, right. that that's what <laughs> well, it is, the it ask is. Well, it is to provide is. a city park, yes, and it is to enable, help us be able to acquire land to provide for housing, because housing is a top priority for Montpelier, and green space is also a priority. Well, you can have both um, for a lot less than a developer would go in and want to kind of knock down everything and put in a couple hundred units and um, that would be it. That's what, that's the other option. Um, Jeff, you want to say anything? <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, but. Um, uh, I'll go to questions. Okay. <laughs> other comments or questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, some of this depends on, on uh, enough people being interested in, in moving into this community. Are you getting good uh, um, we have had we've, We had five original households, and we had a meeting on November 15th uh, uh, to try to introduce this concept in public, and we now have 12. Great. And we have not marketed this. We haven't gone beyond the original Montpelier downsizing group, so there's just a lot of people who don't even know anything about it. So we're ready for that. but. If everybody gave deposits. Everybody's ready to go. So, so far so good. <laughs> and um, I know that you said that uh, this is, you've looked at a lot of different properties and this yeah. is the, the one. And I believe that. And at the same time, um, I'm curious to, to hear what you think about 
how far it is in terms of walking from downtown and even to get down to the bike path. Um, it is it is a walk. It's probably closer to the bike path if you had the public you know, the access the right of way down to that. Um, but I've also talked to the transportation department and planning, and they said, well, if you can get 32 homes down there, we can probably put a bus stop down there. So there are other transportation options, and especially in the winter time. And if this is over 55, people aren't going to go walk into town anyway, even if they were you know, up savings if that was even an option. So that's that's a challenge. And it's all about the terrain, you know. Um, Other comments? And I've talked with Trust for Public Land. I've talked to the uh, Vermont, um, oh, I'm going to get it down there, the Community Loan Fund, uh, the Housing and Conservation Board, and a lot of, and the um, Vermont Land Trust. And the Land Trust is very interested. Um, TPL is interested um, so we do have interest on that and the Commission was very interested in having a park on that side of town because there are a lot of residents out there that really don't have any access to recreation and <clears throat> so yeah. does anybody, have any, anybody yeah. else have any questions? Uh, <laughs> questions? Yeah, Jack, go ahead. So is the idea that the city would buy the entire parcel for $800,000 and then sell your seven acres or 15 acres of it back to you to develop, or what's well, the Well, Jim had said, Effecto had said that they want to sell the entire parcel at one closing, and what we would do is we would have an agreement with the city that at closing we would purchase the acreage that would be suitable for, if you say it's 200,000, say for the, you know, the two parcels there. Um, and then there would be funding from wherever the sources come from. I mean, I look at a $10 million garage and <laughs> $900,000 park, and you know, that's, um, it's all a matter of what do we want? What do we want as a city? I mean, do we want to have both the green space and the housing? The housing is very challenging and affordable housing is being created, but there's not a lot of market rate housing. And a lot of us aren't gonna qualify for affordable housing, so, and we pay higher tax rate. So you're gonna have a greater taxes coming in, you're gonna have, you know, those of us who really need to have smaller homes, have smaller homes, opening up the town for being able to have um, younger families. And there are a number of <coughs> us that are coming from out of the city. So you're gonna be creating more residents that are coming from outside. Uh, go ahead, Don. Did the groups you speak with talk about any financial avenues that they could contribute? The groups, you mean these groups? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, I have talked with them about that. So would we all need to sit around the table and talk about the possibility if you got just an interest nod from the city council? without a financial commitment? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you can't make a financial commitment at a Wednesday night meeting, but, uh, <laughs> but it, is, it is a conversation. And um, uh, the um, land trust was going to hopefully be here. They had two commitments that couldn't be here. Um, I'm just kind of opening the door for the conversation, the big picture kind of thing. This is not a firm proposal. The sketch that Jay did is purely a sketch. It's nothing of a planning nature or it needs approval or any of that, but you know, we're trying to find a way to be able to create the recreation part as well as the residential part. And yes, no, none of us are gonna have a million bucks that we're gonna go and buy 72 acres. Well, <laughs> none of us are developers. I'd be interested in working with a coalition of the group. Oh, terrific. Sure. Oh, terrific. Yeah, that would be ideal. So we can pull, there's Roger Chrisman at um, TPL and then, um, I can't remember the name of the other folks that I've been talking to. And keep in mind, I'm just a resident. I'm not an expert on any of this. So you just do what you got to do when you learn what you got to learn. And <laughs> so, to bring it together. Uh, so I'm going to jump in here and then for Rosie. Um, uh, so just so you know where I'm at, I'm, I'm very interested in this. I think it's really interesting, but there are a lot of questions that I have. So I, I will also say that while I am interested, I'm also very skeptical. And uh, the reason for that, I mean, it, it feels like an incredibly large investment for 16 units of housing. Um, I mean, I know that there's pushback to um, potentially more, but I mean, we need a lot more housing. And I, I personally would be much more interested in on the scale of something like 100 more units. 
Um, and so you know, what's uh, so that's that's one thing. But then that raises this question for me about like what's the right balance? I mean, let's say that we this well, let me back up. Uh, one question is, uh, is this the right space for a park on this side of the river? Maybe, and with this opportunity, it might be. Uh, but I, I think that's a question worth asking. That's number one. Number two, um, if this is the right spot for a park, then what's the right balance of space for housing and space for park? And I mean, I would want to actually go up there and like, you know, check out what we might be <laughs> potentially right. buying, right? To, to consider like how much of this would be, you know, useful or valuable as a park versus housing and what's the, what's the right balance there. In 2007, um, I guess it was, Jim did present it mm -hmm. and I guess he had so much pushback from the local neighborhood for 200 and some odd units yeah. that it just became unfeasible and just, it wasn't going to happen for them. Um, so it's a really trying to weigh, as you say, so that was, the balance. So that was more than 10 years ago, right? Yeah, he said it was around 2007. So okay. You know. okay. And the recession had something to do with it. Yeah, too. no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. And I, well, at the very least, it seems like a conversation reopening, like worth reopening. Um, so though that, at least that's uh, where I am at right now. And the thing is, I, I would guess that to answer those questions, that's going to take more than a month. And yeah, so I'm a little worried for, you know, for, for your sake, right? Like if right. Um, uh, in order for us to have all the information we might need to make a, a sound decision, uh, you know, it's, it's right. going to take more than a month. That, uh, who knows what could change, but right. that, that feels like the reality to me. I mean, we said 32 units only to try to really keep it down to yeah. what was absolutely, you know, necessary for our group, but it doesn't mean that it has to be that. Yeah. But you get into the hundreds and you start talking about the neighbors having a problem with that. Yeah. Um, but having a, a, having a park is, you know, is, it's helpful, you know, when it comes to being able to do this. And there is this survey, so I can't imagine that there's going to be any action on the property until the survey is completed to really determine what the boundary of that park is. Mm -hmm. And that would ultimately be merged with the... Um, um, with whatever we do on this particular property. Yeah. So okay. I appreciate your time. I know I took more than Oh, no, yeah, well, I think Rosie had a question, too. <laughs> oh, so sorry. That's okay. I mean, I, I would really agree with a lot of what Anne said. Um, and I have been a really strong proponent of a park on this side of the river. However, I have spent some time looking at this parcel, and I'm not sure that this park is one that is open to the rest of the Berlin Street neighborhood because to get there, folks have to it's quite a steep walk up a hill for most of the folks living on that side of town. And I would be very cautious about this becoming kind of a private park for just one small neighborhood. The wonderful thing about Hubbard Park is that, you know, so many of our neighborhoods border it, and so it is a park for, for a lot of neighborhoods in the town. Um, and I would want, if we were gonna make that kind of investment, which this would be, I mean, this is, a park on this scale is going to require more park staff, more maintenance. It's it's not just the initial outlay, it's also the ongoing maintenance cost. And if we were gonna make that kind of investment, it would be very important to me that it was thoroughly accessible to all the folks living in the area and not just one small neighborhood. Maybe so I, there's a way of looking to see where the other points of accessibility exactly, might be. Exactly, yes. So that those are some really critical pieces to me is if we were to go down this path, making sure that it was accessible from lots of different neighborhoods around there. Um, and so that that's something I would really yeah, want to flag for I you. Agree with you on that okay. Sure. Well, okay. let's keep talking. Okay, so. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I'm assuming there's no further questions. Okay, great, moving on. All right, so the Montpelier Foundation, uh, coming back to us again. And I forwarded them all. Oh, yep. Thank yeah, we got them. So I was gone most of the time. <coughs> yeah. Like telephone tag a yes, bunch of did. times. We never had a chance to actually hook up. Well, thank you for having us back. Um, we tried to address uh, many of the questions that uh, came out of the meeting uh, at the last meeting regarding the, uh, uh, the makeup of the board, also the investments. 
And there was also a question about, uh, you know, what would the, the people who donated the money, what were their thoughts? And, uh, you know, unfortunately trying to go back to 25 years, some of those don't exist today. It's Vermont National Bank. Uh, 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 Lola Aiken was a, a big donator who's passed away. But the largest donator at the time was the National Life Insurance Company. Uh, they uh, uh, gave the uh, foundation $25,000 in Sentinel stock. Uh, the circumstances of that were that the, uh, uh, there had been a reappraisal in uh, Montpelier at that time, and National Life's taxes actually went down. And so Fred Bertrand, who was the president of National Life at the time, said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take the money that we're uh, not being charged by the city this year, and we're going to give that to the donation, uh, donation to the foundation. And so that's where that $25,000 came from. The uh, most recently, a large donation came from the estate of Alan Weiss, uh, uh, the amount of $35,000. Uh, and I uh, have talked to National Life. Uh, they had emailed me and said, no, we don't have an issue with it. Uh, Vermont Mutual was also a large uh, a donator originally. Uh, they expressed that they don't have an issue, and Alan Weiss's son, Stephen Weiss, also uh, sent an email saying that he does not have a, uh, an issue with the foundation uh, becoming a standalone. Well, I want to thank you for uh, addressing those concerns. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, really pleased with the uh, bylaws as they have been, you know, amended. And so anyway, so I'm, I'm very comfortable um, supporting this and I'd love to hear any comments or questions from other people. Go, go ahead, Don. I had one and it may be how I read it. I didn't understand the non-resident appointment. Well, the idea was that we have residents in Montpelier, okay, that was easy, <clears throat> but then there's a lot of people that, that don't physically live in Montpelier, but spend the bulk of their time in Montpelier. And as we were trying uh, to increase the membership on the foundation, we uh, uh, thought it would make sense to take people who are really vested in Montpelier. They may not live physically in Montpelier, but are really vested in Montpelier, and also make it available to them to be on the, uh, the foundation. I guess maybe it was the way it was worded. It talked about would be Montpelier residents depending on whether or not there were two non-residents on the board. It was just, so, so there is some limit, in, it inferred some limit to non-residents. Correct, yes. But I, I didn't read clear, clear to me, but maybe it was just legalese and I couldn't. Okay, uh, well, I'll defer to. <laughs> and right now, I'm not finding the, the section. Council. I put uh, it in my notes. I think, well, is it section 4.2 <laughs> qualifications? Yeah, qualifications. So, I mean, one, if there's a, if it's just a clarification, yes, then maybe I don't know if you have any suggestions there, but it, I mean, if that's if that's all it is. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, while you're looking for it, Donna, yeah. go no, ahead. No, it, it's right there, and it, it means what you say. But what it reads is, however, no more than two non-residents who have demonstrated a strong commitment to City of Montpelier may be elected. So it's, who have demonstrated it anyway. It just seems a little worded. Would you look at the sentence for me, that's all, when you get back? Okay. Otherwise, yeah. it's <laughs> all right, Glenn. Yeah, no, I was, I was just trying to help. I think uh, the sentence makes sense to me, I think, okay. in that it, it's, the, they all are required to be residents except for the possibility of two as long as they've demonstrated right. commitment to. Yeah, as long the mayor as points yeah. to. And you did a great job on it, incorporating the social responsible investment. Thank you for that. I have a suggestion on this point that we've been talking about, which is that as we learned last time, this is a self-perpetuating board, which means the members of the board would be electing new members. And so I think the members who are on the board would be the ones who would be evaluating whether these non-residents have this uh, a demonstrated commitment to the city. What occurred to me as I was reading this is that there's a broad range between five and 11 members of the board. You could conceivably be in a position where you have, the board consists of two people appointed by the city council, two non-residents uh, <coughs> accepted by the board, and only one person who is 
a resident who was not uh, who, who was elected on their own right and so what occurred to me was that it might make sense that uh, have at least five people on the board who are residents and then if you want to go beyond five members of the board that two of the additional members might be uh, non-residents so that there would always be it would always be dominated by people who are residents. residents. Yeah, I think that would be easy. Yeah. That's good. So for that suggestion, are you suggesting specific language, a language change, or is that, or, or shall we just like a... Mm, we will incorporate that. We can incorporate that? We will that? incorporate okay. that language okay. in. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. I'm like making this as simple as possible. I don't think we have to come back a no, third time. Really, okay. No, please. You got it. You got it. Oh, come on. <laughs> I ran well, into Paul this go. morning. It didn't occur to me to talk about this topic <laughs> when we were talking about the weather. Yeah. Okay, further comments? Yes, Rosie. It, my um, concern last time was about you know our responsibility to the folks who had donated mm -hmm. previously, and I really appreciated you seeking out those members um, or those folks and um, getting some feedback. Um, so I, I feel more comfortable supporting this with that feedback, and I appreciate that. Connor. Yeah, I think if you love something, you're gonna set it free sometimes. So <laughs> uh, appreciate all the work you put into it between uh, the last meeting and now there. It's a volunteer board, so it's, it's not a glamorous job <laughs> fundraising either. So, uh, you know, I, I think I have confidence you did the right thing. And, you know, if you start doing, like, private prison money to build parks and stuff, we can always create a competing entity, I guess. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm there. I'm good. Would anyone like to make a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion. I'll move to approve the Montpelier Foundation's bylaws um, and their request to become an independent Public Benefit Nonprofit Corporation. I'll second. Further discussion? Is, uh, that's yeah. assuming mm -hmm. Jack's change. Uh, Can yeah. we have With that the as condition of the change. Right. Yeah. 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 And that, that's okay, Connor mm -hmm. and Donna. Okay. Yes, Ashley. I just, I'm going to vote no on this. I really struggle when we take sort of public entities and transition them into <laughs> private entities uh, and I appreciate that it seems like it's a done deal. Uh, it's just, it's a hard no for me. I think that there are lots of nonprofits in the area who partner with the city of Montpelier, and I think that we should leave that work uh, to them. But I understand that it looks like uh, everyone else feels differently, so that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, I'll just say while we're discussing that I have qualms in that direction, but I think that it is, uh, I do appreciate the work that has been done to change the bylaws, and I think that it's enough for me to support this particular case for sure. So thank you for that, and thank you, Ashley, for the, the care. Fair enough. Consistently no for everything, <laughs> it feels like, but it's okay. All right, uh, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, all right, moving so now, on. So now, Mayor, it falls to you to appoint two people. That's right. Well, so we'll yeah, probably do that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Well, Thanks let first. us know when you need us to do that. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, so the library is up next. All right, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm Tom McCone, Executive Director of the Library. I'm Rachel Muse, uh, Library Trustee appointed by City Council. Thank you very much for having us on your agenda tonight. And uh, there are a few things in your packet from us, and I, I don't know if uh, you've had a chance to read them all or not. We won't go through everything, but we'll answer questions about anything or highlight anything you'd like. But there are uh, two of the things you received are the our, our report that goes in the annual report and that has a lot of information and, and in writing it this year I really focused on the on the ways that this serves that the library serves our community people don't have these it came as a Yes. Mm -hmm. Who sent it? Was it from you, Sue? I'm trying to yes, for Sue sent it. Okay, 835 this morning. But when it's not on the agenda, it's always a little cumbersome. Yeah. Um, the uh, Go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry that everybody doesn't have it right now, but the the uh, I'm I am glad 
that I tried to reach Jamie yesterday because, um, and then I ended up with Jane because otherwise um, you wouldn't have gotten any of it because I was working with Jamie on this earlier. So, and also the balance sheet for the library, which also goes in the annual report. The, uh, and two other items, of, of an index, just a, a lot of statistics relating to the library, and then uh, a request relating to petitioning to be on, to, on the warning. So uh, we're not going to go through all of those things, but the two basic things are, you know, uh, Rachel and I would like to answer any questions you have uh, about anything in the documents that we sent or about operations of the library, library budget or anything. And then the second thing will be our question of, uh, relating to petitioning. Jack. I got a couple of questions. Um, I think from the, uh, from the index, there were, there are some numbers related to uh, use of uh, computers and use of the uh, Wi-Fi network and uh, you know, 303 average weekly use of public computers, 1105 weekly patent patron use of Wi-Fi. Are those uh, uh, people or are those uh, hours online? Oh, th those are people. So the 303 are times when you, you come to one of the circulation desks and get a, um, a slip so you can access one of our computers for an hour. And uh, so those are numbers, that's the adult library and children's library totaled, mm -hmm. 303 a week. The, uh, the 1,105 access times that people access Wi-Fi, um, that's when people bring their own devices and work in the library. So, so those, are, those are just, that's the number of logons. That's the number of logons. Uh -huh. So they might be on for hours, they might be on for 10 minutes. And it could be someone, does, does it go as far as across the street? To the I church? don't think it does. I don't uh, okay. think it goes beyond our property. It does go on our steps. There are times when we're closed. Maybe times I get there in the morning and there's somebody on the steps using the Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. And uh, on this similar point, it was, uh, it was confusion. I was. Oh, never mind. I see the answer to that. I won't bother you with that one. Okay. Thank okay. you. Donna. Um, I only saw one place that told me the data for Montpelier, and you said around 3,000 had library cards and some 700 kids. In the past, you actually gave us a chart, and, and one of your – think about an email. I have to open each attachment separately. Oh. So the one that's the long narrative, which you say is your library report, uh, I don't find what we used to get, which was this is what the city contributes, this is what other towns contribute, this is their percentage of users, this yep. is their percentage of our revenue. Is that available? That is available. Um, in the five years I've been here, that's not something we've provided. But oh. we can. We oh. can provide oh. that. Yes, it has, because that's where I got this statistics before where we were paying like 70 percent and only 40 43 percent of the users so it was an important report for me yeah um, the the city uh, clearly pays a, a much larger share of the cost of running the library than the towns do for for a, a lot of reasons um, and the city if you figure it on a per capita basis um, pays more than twice as much as the towns pay and there are, uh, the city uses the library enormously more um, in terms of the, uh, the children's library. After school, do we get some U32 students who come by, get off the bus at Spring Street and come over? We do. But the vast majority of, uh, of children who use the library are from Montpelier. And in the afternoon, we have children walking over from all three schools uh, to use the library. And sometimes, it is absolutely wild, and there are just loads and loads of kids in good weather. Sometimes in bad weather, they're outside too. But it's both inside and, and outside. It's actually, there is a, a group of parents who are scheduling the meeting at the library in January because they want to look at the issue of, of where kids are going after school. Um, and it's an issue that we've uh, periodically talked with uh, folks at. Uh, at Union Elementary School and the, the Main Street Middle School about, um, and it's not their responsibility where the kids go, but 
and, and the great majority of kids are great, but sometimes the volume of kids is a real challenge for us. Um, so, but, so the children there is one of the ways, but the, and the, like for the, the story times we have in the morning, it's um, almost entirely Montpelier families using that. And a, a lot of them um, walk over. And you know, so it's, it's very convenient. Um, the, there is the issue of the building. It's a beautiful building. It's, a, it's an important building in downtown Montpelier. It matters a real lot to all of us living in Montpelier and doesn't matter so much to people who are in Callis or Worcester or something. And each of the towns, they have their own buildings that they want to take care of. So as far as the issues of taking care of a building, that matters to us, but in people in the towns, it matters to them to, to maintain their own buildings. We use, in, in, in the narrative, I gave a, a lot of examples about, not, it's not just the library services, but you know, our, our meeting spaces are used by lots and lots of organizations. The great majority of those are Montpelier-based organizations and Montpelier-based groups. Um, and almost all of them are uses that are for free. We have a sliding scale. So if a handful of people want to get together and have a meeting on anything, they can come and reserve a space that costs them nothing. If they want to do it all day, we'll charge them something. If they want to go a couple hours, it, you know, it's nothing. And then, um, but when businesses and, and state agencies or uh, other agencies um, <coughs> want to use the space, we do charge them something. The uh, Democratic, Republican, and progressive parties use our spaces. We charge all of them. Same rate for everybody. But um, even when Senator Leahy comes, we charge them. You charged us. We, yes, we <laughs> charged you. <laughs> That's right. So the um, Senator Leahy, of course, is, if you don't know, he's, a, he's been a huge supporter of the library forever and a day. It's his childhood library. So the. Um, Another issue for us with whenever we ask for increases in the towns, one of the things I feel really good about is for the past three years, we have had all five towns supporting the library. That is a huge challenge because one of the towns uh, was in and out for 20 years and only, only supported the library half the time. And it was, we work really hard, and we still work really hard. We work harder there than anywhere to get the support. Um, we serve Montpelier, and we serve the five towns in Washington Central Supervisory Union. To use a U32 analogy, U32 budget, I believe, has never been voted down going back into the 1970s. And of course, originally it was just that it was at a meeting, but it's been. It's been by Australia ballot for many years. There have been years where there have been, in, in one town or another, there have been movements against the budget. But the votes are all pooled. So, all, so if one town votes against the U32 budget, it won't make a difference. The U32 budget will still pass. In our case, we can't ask one of the five towns for an increase. We can't ask four. You know, we, we have to do it equitably. Last year, we asked a 6% increase for everybody. And when we do that, we run the risk as if we lose one town, we actually have a net loss. And we don't have more revenue, we have less revenue. So it's a real challenge for us. We, out of the five communities, we have two that are solid library supporters. And we have a couple that um, are mixed. And we have one that's a real challenge. So it's um, as far as being able to get a larger share um, from them, it's, uh, it's really difficult for us. And so we have board discussions about, okay, well, how much can we ask and, and still come out ahead? So my understanding, really, beyond all of this great data as to why you're here is because you want an indication of whether or not uh, where the city council is going to be willing to put you all on the ballot uh, without uh, the otherwise you know, necessary signatures. Um, so I, I would love to just t steer the, the conversation in that direction. Sure. Um, and is there anything that you want to say particularly about that before we open it up to uh, 
questions. Um, sure, and thank you. Yeah. And that is a, a, a crucial point for us. The, um, in the years when we have not asked for an increase, as far back as I am aware of, the council has always put us on the warning. So what's different this year is we are asking for an increase. So um, we're asking you to make an exception. It would be an enormous help for us at this time. And in one of the documents, which we may not have all seen yet, we emphasize that you know, we're working on, um, in fact, you tonight you approved the, the initial step for, to help us with a $75,000 grant towards a new elevator. It's a project that, that could cost up to $200,000. And it's part of a, a broader effort with a, a number of building things that we are raising money for. We're very actively working on that right now. We are not gonna come to the city or to any of the towns for any money on that. We've got a complete plan on this, and we've working, been working on this, and we have a consultant working with us. And over the next couple of years, we're very, we're already in good shape as far as how we're off to a good start on this. But um, we have to raise a lot of money on that. So one of the things that'll happen is if, if we need to take a month off to petition, it really, it will cost us a lot of money. <coughs> okay, thoughts from the council on this? Connor, go ahead. What's your mechanism for collecting petition signatures now? Do you canvas? Do you have it in different stores? Oh, all, all of the above. All of the yes. <laughs> a lot of walk-ins at the library, of course. We're lucky we have close to 700 visitors a day there, so we can capture a lot of Montpelier residents there. But as a trustee, I go door to door. I spend a lot of time uh, standing in the cold outside of the farmer's market. Um, and yeah. we, we hit every popular location in town that we can. We hang out at Hunger Mountain Co-op and other locations like that as well. Other questions? Uh, Ashley. Um, I'm in favor of uh, just putting this on the ballot. I, I, I utilized my public library a whole lot growing up. Uh, we didn't, you know, that, that was sort of a thing that we could do that didn't require money, um, as long as I returned my books on time. Um, and I, it, it strikes me that uh, the library is in Montpelier, which I think uh, is really great for the community because one, it brings people here, um, people who may not otherwise have access to the tools and resources that exist at our library, but also because I think it adds um, to our downtown. I think that it brings people in, especially younger folk after school, um, and I know that it can be overwhelming, but at least they're at our library. Unfortunately, there have been a few incidents in the last year, um, one quite serious incident, um, but I, I believe that this is the kind of thing that our community should be focusing on, is really sort of fostering those opportunities for learning and development and places for families to be. Um, and, and so for me, this is a huge yes. Uh, and I wish that we, um, I, I hope that the council uh, feels similarly, but um, I, I just, I, I feel like this is what my role as a city councilor is, is to promote those kinds of things in our community um, and, and uh, maybe not so much some, some other ventures. Thank you. I totally support this. I think it's, uh, Kellogg Covered Library is, uh, is a tremendous asset to the community. It's recognized um, it, uh, as as a great library. I believe it's uh, there's only one library in the entire state that has a higher annual circulation than the uh, than the Kellogg Covered Library. Um, the uh, voting uh, results year after year show it has tremendous support among the uh, voters of Montpelier, and I think we. Uh, we should do this. Donna. Well, Ashley, I'm going to be the no. <laughs> and that's because in my six years on the board, it's almost every other year you come with an increase. And we mm -hmm. make these small, very small organizations who do not get enough funding through the Montpelier Fund. Uh, community fund. fund. Community, mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Community Fund account do signatures and they don't have nearly the, the access you do of most a huge number of voters so i don't think it's fair to let the big system mm -hmm. not do what we ask little systems to do and that twenty thousand dollars i want more housing i want more public art i want another police officer so i think uh, the voters need to say yes to this asking beyond the three hundred fifty thousand we already have in the budget so 
I'm going to be a no vote. It's not against the library. It's against the process that you're asking us to cut, shortcut for you. The total is 350000 Pardon? Th that 350000 includes the increase. Well, I think she yeah. was talking about the bond payment, too. Okay. Yeah, but we, we have a lot of money. In have that, too. Want to add it all up? Go ahead, um, I'm a yes, and uh, if it goes to no, I think I would like to offer my services getting more signatures. Uh, I, I understand the, uh, the same process for everyone that, that Don is talking about, and I think that for, for me that balances out uh, partly with what Jack pointed out and what you point out in the letter. Uh, about the, the overwhelming long-term support from the residents for the library. So I think we can we can put you on the ballot personally. Thank you. Rosie. I feel very conflicted because as a voter, I will sign your petition and I will vote for you for this and I um, I really believe that libra the library is very important and the services that it provides to all, folks all across the spectrum, the socioeconomic spectrum are really important. Um, it is our default day homeless shelter um, in many communities and, and um, I'm sure in Montpelier as well. Yes. Um, and um, I, so I'm very, this is a good thing. We, I, I believe as a resident that we should put um, money behind it. However, I'm very cognizant of this process that we have set up um, because we have limited resources. And if we say yes to you today about going around this process, how can we then say no to uh, Central Vermont Home and Hospice, who is also a wonderful organization who does wonderful work, or any of the other wonderful organizations that come to us and, and do have fewer resources to collect signatures? Um, and I'm, you know, I would be willing to give that one time yes if it was a one time yes, but it's not because everyone else is going to see, okay, well, we can just ask the council and not have to go do those signatures, and then our system that we've set up is, is broken. Um, so I'm feeling very conflicted about this, and I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> In terms of the one time, this this is the only time we have asked for this. Because no, you are going. It's the only time we've asked to, to be put on the warning when we've asked for more money. I'm sorry, I've been here when you've been here before. I can yeah, I think probably before Tom's time, but I, yeah, it's. I I have I have never asked you for this okay. before. Right. Other thoughts. I guess yeah, what I'm actually. what I'm struggling with is the public good that this actually serves. Like literally every single day, there are 700 people on average that walk through the door, and I appreciate that there is a process by which signatures can be collected. Um, but I I am struggling with this notion that we can spend millions of dollars on something that doesn't benefit local people exclusively, and and instead benefits. Uh, another private business entity and be and be pushing back about a, a process by which an organization that serves every single person in Montpelier and and has a partnership with other communities and frankly I mean while it's disappointing that other communities don't want to fund the library I cannot imagine being where I sit today as a city council member without my public library I, I, I really, it, it's, it wouldn't have been possible. And, you know, my grandfather, up until a few weeks before he died, frequented the public library because that was sort of his outing. And, you know, being, being able to read things that in large print and, and having access to those things was a social event for him. And at, you know, at 91, yeah. that, that was a big thing. And um, I remember going to story hour with him when I was a child because that's what there was to do. And, and so to me, um, I, you know, I appreciate that there is a process, but this to me is is an extension of city services because you serve every resident regardless of income, regardless of ability to pay for play, uh, and um, and so I, I just I feel like that's an important distinction to make. Uh, Jack, I think Donna raised a good point in general, which was how do we fund city services and tonight isn't really the night to do it but i have really had questions ever since it was created of, about having the uh, 
the Mount Montpelier City Foundation be the end, be sort of the clearinghouse for community is, foundation community, community foundation, foundation. Be, foundation. Be, be the oh, community fund. Fund. be the clearinghouse yes. for fund funding requests oh. and cutting people off the off the ballot the way it was before so uh, I think that's a conversation to have and I'm not sure if that's what you were getting at but uh, we're not going to say yes to all of our departments for their increases so why should we say yes to this yeah and and, and we're not saying yes to this we're up providing an opportunity for the voters to say yes but there we are. Uh, Tom, go ahead. May I have one more thing? Uh, thank you very much for your comments, and I, and I appreciate them very much. The, uh, even the ones that are, have concerns about this. The number one reason I'm asking for an exception this time around is we have had a number of um, unanticipated expenses in the past year. So we had to find ways to cover those things. We reduced our evening hours. Um, year-round, but that started during the summer. We reduced the evening hours and we reduced the Saturday hours. We're not going to do that again. You know, and in other tight years, we reduce how much money we spend on technology or what or money that we spend on uh, buying books or DVDs or that we pro provide for programming or other areas. And we very regularly, going back for 20 years dealing with a very tight budget the library is constantly underfunded maintenance of the building that is really caught up to us very badly I mean that's why we had big expenses in this past year it's because it's always been underfunded so we have started a process we've been working on this for a couple of years to turn this around number one to get caught up on some of these needs we have our elevators 45 years old it's going to die at any time. We need to, we want to be able to schedule a, re, a replacement of the, not the car itself, but the mechanisms and the controls. We want to schedule that because when, when it's out, we'll be, the elevator will be down for up to two months. If it's not scheduled, and if, it just, if we just wait until it dies, well then we're looking at four months or longer of not having an elevator. So, but we have been very seriously, Donna, working on changing how this is done. We have plans, you know, we, we've outlined what the needs are in the building, short-term, long-term uh, building maintenance issues. We talk about the big things like the roof and the elevator and the, and the windows, which we're having done right now. We're working on, on applying for grants for these things as much as we can. We're in the process of meeting with a process we started about three months ago, meeting with people who have been generous to the library in the past, and uh, and asking them, you know, this is not a it's a quiet phase of this campaign, to to get us going because when, before you go public with a a campaign, you want to raise like two thirds of it, two thirds of the money. So that's where we are right now. We're working on that phase. If we need to stop that for a month, my biggest concern is we have a half a dozen um, trustees and five out of the six of them are from Montpelier who are very actively working on meeting with donors. If we have to petition, most of them are going to be petitioning for a month and not meeting with donors and we're, we're, just, we're just on a roll right now. So my reason for asking for an exception really is I'd like to not m lose the momentum that we have going on that. We won't get to as many people. It's, it's, it's not that it will be delayed. It'll be that, you know, we, we have a, a long list and we will just run out of time. So thank you very much for your consideration. Yeah. Um, so I just want to add a little bit here, um, which is um, I also feel very conflicted about this because of the, the process issues um, around um, the really the, the rule of thumb, I guess, that we've had in previous councils, uh, which was that, you know, as long as the budget was the same, then we didn't, um, it would require that, you know, you have um, the, you know, go out and get signatures. Uh, to be 
totally honest, I'm not sure that that's my rule of thumb. Like, I'm not sure that I, I want that to be the rule of thumb. I mean, that, that idea of that, like, as long as you don't increase your budget, then we'll just put it on the ballot for you. That's not a part of the, the rule. That, correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that was just um, something, that was a tool that the council used to try to make it equitable. Um, and I do want to find some way to make it equitable, but I'm not sure that that's it for me. Um, and so while I am in in limbo as to what my what like what my philosophy is about that, I'm I'm willing to support it. <laughs> so which I realize is maybe not you know like I probably should have a rule of thumb figured out by now, but I don't. Um, so but in any case, the the history on this, yeah. not not library specifically, was back when we had all the uh, the art issues on the ballot. The council policy was if it's the same amount as the prior year, we'll put you on the ballot. If you want an increase, you've got to petition for the entire amount. So it was, you know, okay, if you want more money, you've got to work a little harder for it. Um, when the community fund came into place, most of those items that had been on the ballot went to the community fund, um, leaving only the library essentially as the outlier that was in that same old situation. And because the library's funding was so much greater than the community fund, we just kept them outside, and, the, and so the, the policy continued with them. If you want an increase, you consider it. With the community fund, it is different. People have the opportunity to apply for the community fund, but if they don't get money from that process, they have the option of, of doing so. Now, la so last year, you had Central Vermont Home House, Health and Hospice at 20,000, People's Health and Wellness Clinic at 2,000, and Good Samaritan Haven at 4,000, who were not funded through the community fund who all were required to petition to be on the ballot. And I do recall at least one of those agencies did make a plea to the council because they had missed the deadline or something like that and the council still chose. So that was, that's the history, but the, the community fund is a little different than the library and library has always been this sort of, how do you handle them? So it's, it's, that's, it's a precedent in practice. I don't know if, it, if that's helpful or not, but that's how we got to be where we are. Okay. Uh, Glenn. Just to follow up with Bill, uh, one of the notes in here is that with the other towns, when you petition, you need 5% of the registered voters. With Montpelier, you need 10. That's correct. Is that part of the? That's in the charter. Okay. No matter how big you are. OK, well, any further comments on this? OK, does anyone want to make a motion? I would move that we uh, approve the library's request uh, to be added to the ballot with the uh, projected increase, which I think puts it at $350,000. 350471 That dollar amount. <laughs> <laughs> and the increase is only 19838 It's not a $350,000 increase, just right. to be clear. The total, the total but for those that are listening. Uh, and Jack has seconded further discussion. Um, I, I think I'll support it, just as I'll reemphasize it is an ex exception, um, and it's a capacity issue uh, this year for you folks, and uh, I'd say we would afford other groups who came in and had other such issues um, the same opportunity to come in and ask this, so I would support it. Thank you. Danger, danger. <laughs> danger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Fair enough. Uh, Glenn. I also just want to take this opportunity to apologize for the books that my dog has been eating. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're paying for them, right? <laughs> and apologize. Uh, I guess I would also just encourage us to consider uh, beyond this instance uh, what should or should not trigger an, ex uh, an exception to the petition rule. Because um, there, there probably is, well, there probably is. Uh, there, are, there are groups that we would we would turn down, and what would that look like? So, I encourage you all to do some thinking about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm like Did talking we to myself. Did turn down Home Health last year? Didn't Did they have I don't remember. Gather signatures. We, we made them get signatures. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Good Samaritan. And, and Good Samaritan. Um, some really small yeah. people. Yeah, no, it's true. Case. It's true. Just vote. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, fair enough. Geez. Further discussion. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Okay, I think it passed. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you very much. And all right, moving on.
Cool. All right. So, um, can we take a break? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'd like to be kicking back up again at seven. How long do you want? Seven. I'll defer to you. Seven fifty-five. A lifetime. Seven fifty-five. That's my goal. Before we get started with the next item, I just want to um, just uh, add tag on one thing to the conversation we just had, um, which is that uh, I think we, it would probably be good for us to have a conversation about our uh, policy around when do we um, exempt people from needing to get petitions when there's not someone in front of us um, asking for that. And so um, I was just talking with Bill about let's put that on as an agenda item you know to talk about what is our what is this group's policy um, you know want to be sometime in like June I know I think Rosie you won't be here but um, you know that'll be the the new council and I'll give you some confidence yeah please do <laughs> um, but that, that way we you know we can have that uh, history out there and uh, you know um, you know, thoughtful conversation uh, prior to um, needing to use it. So anyway, just wanted to make a note of that. Um, cool, moving on, uh, the sprinkler ordinance. This is the second reading of the ordinance you reviewed at the last meeting, which came out of the, the group that uh, Rosie and Glenn work with and uh, the variance committee. And I think this is just moving this forward in the process. So I just want to officially open the public hearing, doing that. Um, comments from council? Okay, Jack. I think we should just do this quickly. Great. <laughs> comments from the public? No? Okay. <laughs> Great. All four of you. Um, uh, okay, any other further questions? Okay. Uh, I'm going to close the public hearing then. And so this being the end of the second hearing, I think we get to, I'm, I'm not looking at the language, uh, but I, yeah, I think we need to uh, some kind of a motion to adopt uh, this language. I move that we adopt the language as uh, proposed. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm done yet. This is the second yet. sprinkler yeah. ordinance. This is the one we discussed at the last meeting, basically to mirror the state language regarding um, parking garage requirements. Right. And so we drafted, Chief and I drafted the language you have. Pretty simple, just reflecting the state code. Yeah, the language you have in front of you was right out of NFPA 1. Great. Uh, Jack? Open the public oh, yep, hearing. yep. So I'm going to officially open the public hearing on this particular set of changes. Further comments? Okay, public? Nope. Okay, great. I'm going to close the public hearing. Oh, sorry, I was reading. Oh, okay. <laughs> Co question? Comment? I just wanted to give the, the fire chief an op opportunity to share whether you feel this is I do. a good thing. I do. We took a look at it. Um, when we... Uh, um, when Chris and I started reviewing the parking garage, we realized that the parking garage falls under, it's a new public building. But when we started taking a look at it, we realized that um, that probably didn't make a lot of sense. And then we looked at NFPA 1, and we looked at the fire code, the state fire code, and realized that it's not required in, for a, as the wording says, for a freestanding open parking structure that, uh, um, you know, it's basically four levels of parking lot is what it is. So we, I reached out around the state uh, to um, fire chiefs in St. Albans, Burlington, South Burlington, and Brattleboro that have these structures, and they, and they follow NFPA 1. Three weeks ago at a New England fire chiefs meeting, I reached out to the state of Rhode Island and Connecticut, and they also only require in freestanding open parking structures. They follow NFPA 1 also which does require, this building will be required to have a standpipe system in it. For those who aren't familiar, a standpipe system is just basically a six inch water main that runs up through each stairwell. And at each landing, there's a place where we can attach a fire hose and turn it on and have water available. That is required under NFPA 1. So this structure will have that, or any uh, freestanding open parking structure would be required to have that. So, so I do support this. Yes. 
it check. seems obvious, but uh, I, I assume there's room to interpret uh, what freestanding means. Like, I assume that the uh, city center building uh, parking ramp is not considered freestanding because it's attached directly to the building. Correct. And that is a sprinkled, that, okay. that parking garage has sprinklers. And I'm also, though, picturing the uh, parking garage up in Burlington that was adjacent to uh, uh, the, the mall downtown mm -hmm. where there were, uh, at a couple of different levels, there were direct connections going into entrance uh, doors of, uh, of the building. Would that be considered freestanding? No. This? No, okay. Is, it, it, is, it, any connection, any physical connection. Any connection, yeah. Okay. And any underground or below, uh, below grade parking, by, um, by NFPA would would require sprinklers also. Okay. But a, a free, it has to be a completely freestanding, separate building. Great. Thanks. Uh, uh, yes. Donna, did the our current parking structure have that in their blueprints? The, um, what, what you're saying is required. The sprinkler system. Uh -huh. We Not are the sprinkler system, but what you said, Dan, the standing pipe in the stand pipe. Yes, they already had that. Good. Just yep. checking. Yep. Yep. Good. Yeah. The, the architect knew. He he knew the the code. He knew it re okay. was required. Yeah. Okay. Great. Further comments? Okay. I've already closed the public hearing. Um, so we're going to set the second reading, second for, next week. reading for next week. Do you do you think we need a motion for that? Mm -hmm. I would move that we set the second public hearing for, is next week the enough time? Yep, the 19th. It is, okay. Mm -hmm. I would move that we set it for our next meeting on December 19th. Second. For the discussion, all in favor please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you. And uh, some parking ordinance changes. Parking. <laughs> Still on the agenda. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Good evening. Moving right along. Moving right along. Mm -hmm. So I'm Tom McArdle, <coughs> excuse me, the Public Works Director, and presenting uh, four parking ordinance uh, recommendations. Um, so we have a public hearing. It's the first public hearing to enact a, an ordinance change. I'm going to interrupt you to open the public hearing. Okay. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we did notify all the uh, uh, interested parties, uh, we believe we did, uh, through mailings, um, posting on the, the website and newspaper. Um, we've not had really any comments. Uh, they're not uh, um, tremendous, tremendously impactful. Um, the streets uh, that are involved, I'll go through them, Mather Terrace is pretty narrow. Um, not wide enough to support on-street parking. This is primarily legislative session um, issues. Um, so we don't have a lot of parking um, demand there, but when we do, we've had to post it with, uh, with some signs under police order. Um, that's a prohibition on both sides. Guernsey Avenue, same sort of thing. Um, primarily visitors uh, of the street. Um, delivery vehicles as well, we need to accommodate them. Um, there will be uh, allowed on um, one side, I believe, is the way we did this one, with uh, some intersection clearance. Um, Berry Street, uh, this kind of goes back to the uh, um, old days when there was a market there. Um, so we've, we've had a limited parking, uh, short-term parking there in the past. It was taken, it was removed, and now it's back again. So it's consistent with city practice to address that. Uh, police have um, identified long-term parking there, so this is kind of the overflow um, for our parking, unmetered parking um, in this area um, taken up by uh, long-term parkers, so this will help with business. And um, the last one is just uh, truly a, a housekeeping matter. Um, Baldwin Street was modified uh, through a project um, taking out the several irregularities. It's a consi consistent width. Uh, we don't need the uh, seasonal change and it's now included in the uh, winter parking ban under um, the event-based ordinance. So that's just a brief summary of the four um, ordinances and except for questions. Ashley, 
Um, so with regard to the Berry Street change, I'm just curious why 6 a.m. to 9 p.m.? Because I don't think that we have any parking enforcement that late. I mean, I know law enforcement can, can write the ticket. It just seems like um, if all the other parking goes into effect at 8 a.m., I mean, I understand maybe 7 a.m. because I think the bakery may open at 7 a.m., but after work, I mean, if you're a resident in that area, and full disclosure, I used to live diagonally across the street from there and sometimes had to park on Berry Street. Um, it, I appreciate that it would it be desirable to see someone, I mean, somewhere 6 a.m. came from, but um, you don't have to move your car from the city lot if you have to park there until I believe 7 a.m., is that right, or 8 a.m.? So if there's a parking ban. So I guess mm -hmm. my request would be that either we change those hours, you know, from, from maybe 7 to, what's the parking meter, 5? Can I interrupt you? I, I appreciate that you asked, yes. my friend. Yes, feel free. <laughs> I really appreciate the ask. You're the first person all week to ask <laughs> they can interrupt me. Well, I want to stop you uh, because the – the way I read that, and I appreciate your interpretation, but the way I read that, it applies to the, specifically to the parking at 203 to 5 and, and 207 Berry Street, where the, that 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, right. restriction applies. This is a separate, and I can see why you would interpret it that way. It wasn't intended to be that. I added it to Berry Street because we already had a Berry Street section. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps the better move would be to um, either add the time to that um, as being um, a, a time period that the council suggests or um, create its own section so that it's separated from that. But that, that 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. applies to the other piece, not this one, the new one. Hold on. I don't know that I followed you. Um, reading the, the, that's one sentence, 15 minute limited parking. Yes, is also uh, provided two, on uh, so situ situated at this location from 9 a.m. to or 6 a.m. to, to 9 p.m. Then it's a new sentence: 15-minute right. limited parking um, for the two spaces at 78 Berry Street, where no time um, period during the day is is uh, applies. So it's a separate sentence. It's, I see. The way it's structured, I can see why that would be inter um, be confusing. Yeah, I just I, I'm fine with with making it like during business hours mm -hmm. limited. It just strikes me that having to get up, and as someone who's lived in Montpelier and has had to get up at the wee hours, I, that was hard to find a replacement for what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know when it's like negative ten degrees out and you have to go move your car at five forty five. There is nothing worse than the sight of me going to move sure. my car at five forty five and it's negative ten out. Um, and so I just, I want to be mindful that the, the council also exempted that area from having required parking uh, in the zoning. And so there are, are lots of units in that area that don't have parking and residents need those spots. And I appreciate that we need to be mindful of business operations too. Um, so I would just ask that we, we change okay. those hours to be more in line with other we'll, uh, city areas. Again, it doesn't apply to the new section, mm -hmm. but the way this reads is that this particular 15 minute limitation applies only during that time so then the limitation goes away right. you'd be able to leave your vehicle after 9 p.m. through to 6 a.m. No, with problem. no 15 minute restriction no I know but what I'm saying is 6 a.m. is awfully early for that to begin uh, yes and then 9 p.m. is awfully late for that to end when the business right. closes I think at two or maybe th three at the latest four at the so, latest so yeah. I, I could offer a suggestion Jack you had do something is uh, just to understand what's going on here in this subsection A, that first sentence going through 9 p.m. is what's already in that's the That's correct. That's already and then there. The bold and italic is only the new stuff. That's the new. Okay. So I think what actually uh, uh, Councillor Hill is suggesting is that we alter the existing ordinance um, to um, say 7 a.m. Um, to like 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. or 6 right. p.m. or just something. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. As someone who lived there, the, the businesses are, are closed. Understood. 
So we warned this as a restriction specific to Those uh, this address, not mm -hmm. uh, not a alteration to an existing ordinance mm -hmm. that affects those. So I'm not sure if it uh, would require a new public hearing, first reading on a restriction, or if the council has the prerogative to alter something that was not on your. I think you could, as long as we notice people for the second reading of the change of intent. I think they can do that. Okay, so you're. Can I ask you a question, Tom? Sure. What are your other meters? What times <coughs> are they in our ordinance? Are they listed in our ordinance at time that they're affected? I don't know offhand. Um, I believe the parking enforcement be begins on, um, um, as far as the meter patrol begins at about eight. eight. Um, yeah, it's eight to so five for parking meters. Right. Right, but for other things, so I thought you started earlier because patrol can came by. That's right. And get people to move. Yes. So Seven a.m. is it's when it's, it's, it's not just by the foot trap for foot patrol. That's correct. It would be good to have a consistent with what the other ones say. I think. You are perhaps right. Um, that again wasn't the intent of this ordinance, but perhaps there is some other house cleaning that needs to be done. I, I think is if I understand what you're saying correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what the date of this. This goes back quite a ways. Great. Great. Um, I think we have a so comment or question. Yeah. <coughs> so this is at a public hearing. Um, I, I live right off that street. And um, I don't really know what meters or what. And I'm, in general, I assume no one else does. She, uh, Councilor Hills, really well put what my concerns would be. But I prefer to just be consistent. Um, and so I just wanted to have a second voice for that. Thanks. Thank you. So this is not a metered area. So th this is re referenced to, but I understand There's, your point. Yeah. <laughs> yep. right. Understood. I don't want to have to wake up. That's really. <laughs> 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 yes. I, don't, I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I totally get it. I have been that person, like getting out there first thing. It's not a pretty sight for anyone. Where is two hundred three? Is that Bear down Street? near the market? It's down, I so. Two, so t uh, it's. 82 is where we're at at, at Nelson Street, so it would be. It's I'm I thinking it's, it's near the. The, the near little the, convenience that's store. What I'm, wondering. I'm pretty right. sure that's where yeah. it is. Because I was at 178, and then that was Kitty okay. Corner from there, and then. Right. They've had a 15, and it could be that they're open. It may have dated I mean, back I to when they were open at 6. I think that they are open later, although I don't know if it's nine. You know, I think I, they I were think at the time. That's what was the origin of that in that one space. I think 207 to 209 is in front of the Bear Street Market. Right. Yes. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Just to catch so up. Does, okay. So to be clear, you, you would, your suggestion is that we change that to 7 a.m. Yes. And that the section the that is actually um, worn for 78 um, the Barry, uh, to 82 Berry Street that um, we include a time yes. consistent with the other? Yes. Okay. I'm fond of things being predictable and easy to read. For According to 7 a.m. to 6 p.m.? Assuming that that's what the Don't know what the bakery's is. hours are, but. Um, Closes it. 1.30 on weekdays, 2 o'clock But I think yeah. having it consistent with other, like, I mean, we, we stop traffic and or I've parking five enforcement six. at yeah. 6. But we and will five. hear from the market if they're going to, if it's, if they're open, if the market is open till af after 6 or whatever, we'll hear from them because they were pretty uh, yeah. vocal about this right, change they are. when they. So typically open, these so hours do. Late, we might want to. On the restrictions um, that support a or uh, short-term parking for a specific business, it is it does coincide directly with their hours, so that's why I'm thinking it probably goes with the market with that with those times, and then it should match the bakery's hours. So we'll find out what that is. So. I don't know who else is looking on Google Maps, but it says 10 to 8 right now for the market. For the market. Um, 10 to 8. So they've yeah. changed, and and that's not uncommon. That's one of the issues with. These restrictions, I guess, is that yeah. that once they're in the books, they're here for, for a long, long time. So. Okay, I, so, oh yeah, go ahead, Ashley. I, just, I have an unrelated comment now as someone who lives uh, very close to the elementary school. I've seen lots of folks try to take that shortcut that we all used to take 
um, and get stopped by the gate. If there is any way that that can be signed on both sides, like street closed, because I, I watch people all the time, like come in, you know, because their GPS will tell them to turn down there, and then they're trying to turn around in the middle of the road. It's not on here. It's not an ordinance change that needs to happen, but um, given the snow that is piling up and the number of people that I've seen just making that sort of 18 point turnaround back up to uh, back up to towards you know uh, so you're talking about Park Avenue and yes. Hubbard Park Street was yes was no I know but people turn down there now thinking that it's open it's right Pe people don't realize I watch people do it all the time it's, it's one but it just if there's right. something one way something one that way says so like but we we changed that to two way to yeah. allow because that section is closed right. because people Just need so to the get to that. Just residents here can get in right. and out. So but I if there think was what we need is road closed ahead. Or yes, street closed exactly. Ahead. Just something because yeah. sometimes you can't even mm -hmm. see the, or no the outlet. fence. Right, no outlet. Something. Just you can't see the fence always until you're almost on it, and mm -hmm. so people have just kind of been going, and then all of a sudden, like, whoops. Got it. Good suggestion. Okay. Thank you. So do you have enough information for coming back to us? As long as um, you're comfortable with us adding the change for whatever the bakery is, and we'll leave that to. Um, now, there's a, I, I suppose there's a way so that this can go away, uh, be eliminated, um, such that wording is added that when the business closed, this ordinance terminates or ceases to um, exist. Um, I don't, think we can do an ordinance totally. I don't think we should do an ordinance totally based on one business hours. We should be at least covering them, but maybe a little bit over. That's, that's another way of doing it. There could always be a business there. There was a business there before. I don't know why it was rescinded. And then, so that, that's, that's another approach. Seven to nine. Is Seven to nine would be, would, should cover it, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, this just seems like a really good opportunity to keep piling on more more things. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Tom, for showing up. And, uh, <laughs> I'm your sounding board. <laughs> um, the, all of the, uh, the the parking changes have reminded me that a neighbor of mine on Prospect Street uh, has asked me to suggest that we limit parking on Prospect because of similar reasons to what, what's stated in here. Um, we've had a bit of a change in use over the last few years. More people are um, uh, airbnb their homes or parts of them, and, and we have more cars on the road than we used to, and it's starting to get tight in a couple of spots. So I don't know if you've already looked at it uh, recently, or if you would be willing to, to take a second look uh, along this way, but I think that would be great. I have not looked at it. I'm not aware that that is. So, what is specifically the concern in the specific area? And yep, perhaps so you could you could send me a note. Yeah. Um, yeah. About that, and, and I would. These um, reviews are not just public works. It includes fire right. and um, and police uh, fire on, the, on public safety access and yeah. police under enforcement, and that's so we kind of work together on that. So and that, that's the basic send an email that I can loop everybody in. I'll do that. So you with okay, an so address. You'll follow up on that. Okay. Um, okay. I'm Any further comments? So I just want to yes. be clear what we, I want to make sure all the business owners and all the residents get adequate notice. And I'm not sure that we've been very clear about what we're planning to do so that they get adequately noticed for next time. Um, That's a good point. What I feel like Where we need to land? give Tom some more concrete language so that he can then notice the people who would be impacted. Tom, what do you feel like is your direction right now? Um, the alteration to the the existing section, we would notify the there's a few businesses there, so each of them um, would receive that notice, and as well as the adjoining owners. But notice um, for one, what? The they would receive um, what we send is the the full right, memo. But the, but the question the is, what, what's the change? What what are you thinking oh, about? Oh, i The change. Yep. Um, I thought it was more the manner of delivery. No. Um, so the existing section for 15-minute limited parking, 
would be revised from uh, 6 a.m. as the start time to 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. The proposed new language would also be uh, would be 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. So both both sections would have the time restriction included. Does that seem adequate to you, there, Ashley? Okay. Okay. Everyone's okay with that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, okay, I'm gonna, um, unless there's further comments. All right, I'm gonna close the public hearing and um, I think we need a motion regarding the second hearing. I would move that we uh, set this for a second reading at, next, at the next meeting. Next week. Yeah. On December 19th. I'll second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. And thank you for asking about interrupting. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so we have a bit of an update on the North Branch. Sure. Case. So this is just a follow-up to a message I sent um, you earlier. I got a copy for you. Um, so I, you know, I can go through it if you if you'd like. We at our last meeting we had a discussion about. It's okay. Well, I need this now, but I'll hand it to you when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I just Great just want to well, just want to refer to it, then I will hand it to you. Um, so, uh, at the last meeting, we talked about a process to look at options for uh, the properties on the north side of the east or the east side, excuse me, of the north branch, the three properties that the city owns or has an interest in. And uh, I was asked to put together a working group to look at that, and I've uh, made some effort, talked to some people, and they have, I think, assembled a group. Or I haven't actually reached out to, but I, I think we have a structure of who we might get around the table to look at this. But the first place I wanted to start was with our funding sources to see um, what, if any, restrictions we had. And, um, and there are some, so I tried to articulate those as best I could. As I said, I uh, ran this by um, the state and fed drill people I met and they both said yes this accurately <coughs> reflects our conversation because yeah. we've had issues in the past where we've had a conversation and, yeah, that's, you didn't understand what we told you so uh, anyway I think the main is issue is that we don't you know while the city owns those three properties we purchase them with federal money and so therefore there's an ongoing federal interest in the use of the, the properties and that they were purchased for this specific project, the One Taylor project, and for transportation and transit uses. Uh, one, one of the lots, uh, and, and this is partially at our request because of our prior plans, uh, has been declared non-essential and, 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 and you're right, they are correct, we could build a road around that lot and not necessarily need the former TKS lot, that's the parking lot next to uh, the drawing board, not where popular beverage was, but the parking lot next to it. Uh, and so they are expecting reimbursement for that. Uh, that wasn't an issue for us because we planned to sell the combined new property and that's how that was going to be addressed and that's how they understood it. So we never, they never really articulated that clearly. So, uh, and in addition, as, as you know, they provided additional funding to our project and again, it, uh, they were clear, they agreed that it was not conditioned on the sale, however, I know I certainly said, well, and you know you're going to get money from the sale of the property. So, um, you know, it was definitely part of the, the conversation. Uh, and then the, um, yeah, so I think it's all, it's all laid out. So the question is, uh, there may well be some, there almost certainly will be some financial uh, obligation to um, using these properties for something other than the way they're properly designed, that currently designed, not properly designed. And so would be the cost of a park. So my only question was before we continued forming a, a committee and a group, which was your direction last time, was just to make sure you had seen this information and that if you wanted to change course or do anything different, you could. And if you don't, we'll just continue. But I uh, wanted to be sure that everyone was doing this with full um, full knowledge of, of what is out there. I did have a f one follow-up communication um, with the VTrans official and he did um, basically saying how, how soon would we need to pay back the money even if we decided to go and he said probably we could do it up to two years. So just, but no more than that. 
So your the cost, if we wanted to have total control, is three hundred and four thousand dollars, or there's an additional. I didn't quite follow all sure. the different financial impacts. <laughs> well, it's a little complicated in that the the um, <coughs> the three lots we we bought have since been converted to two, and that's a subdivision that's already happened, and they now exist as two lots. So so what we purchased each individual from her is kind of different. So the the appraisal for the new, what I call lot two, the com combination of, of mostly the TKS lot and part of the association for the blind lot in the back, the, what we were going to sell, that was appraised at 380000 a couple of years ago. And that is what we were going to be paid by the Moat Trust to purchase. And, and we bought their land for three sixty. The state then can take that three eighty and match federal funds so that they can add to their transportation budget. So that becomes a 20% match for them. So that's worth about $1.2 million to the state. So it's not chump change. They want it back. They recognize that we made we paid 20% of that when we bought the property. So if they were to sell it to you know a private seller, they would uh, get the full 380 or whatever. It's, we'd have to do a new appraisal, first of all, and come up with a new value. If, But the city would get a 20% discount off of that because we spent 20% buying it. So that's the recognition. So at the most recent appraisal for 380, 304 is 80% of that. Um, so that would be, that would clean out all federal rights for that new parcel. You know, we could argue that, well, we only want to buy the rights out of the smaller parcel and you know, see where that goes. But that would be certainly um, unequivocally a clean way to, to do that. But We'd have and to if we do that, we don't also owe the state money. The, the right, state and feds the are one and the same. Okay. All right. the, so the VTrans acts as the agent for Federal Highway. Um, and But the, the interesting thing apart about this is that even though it was paid for with federal money, it goes back to the state as state money, which they can then use to match more federal money. <laughs> All right. So. Simple as that. Right. Um, otherwise, <laughs> they, so the, the part I didn't really get into here because it was just long, but just so people are clear, it, when they've determined something is, is non-essential or surplus property, you know, if we don't do anything, they will then seek to dispose of it and they will put it out to bid, to top bidder. And then the other thing, the next thing they do is um, see if any state agency wants it um, and, and to them, and then they would go come to the city. So there is a you know a backhanded way in which if nobody bid on it privately and nobody from the state wanted it, then the city could possibly get it anyway, as surplus property. But it's 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 you know it's how many times you get through waivers right before you. Um, yeah, go ahead. Was, oh, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, one more question I had was so right now they've deemed it not not non essential. Um, if we were to do a transportation related thing, such as one of the options we kind of mentioned last time was rather than doing a building or a green space, but putting parking there and removing parking from Berry Street in order to make that last connection of the, the bike path or the multimodal path on Berry Street, to me that's a transportation related item. Could we get them to possibly change I, their I raised that issue and said, you know, they said number one, it would have to be open to the public. So it couldn't be, you know, private parking spaces for designated for an entity. And, you know, they would, part of the issue they have, and, and I, you know, I get this, they're, they're not, I, actually they've been extraordinarily cooperative. I want to actually give a shout out to V and Federal Highway because, you know, we asked them to put this all together for us so we could sell this in the first place and they were extremely helpful and now they get that we're revisiting it and they're trying to, they've been great about telling me what the rules are. but. The funding was for the one Taylor project, and it was for this part was basically to put a bike path in and to put a road in, and um, and that that's the sort of federal transportation interest. So, you know, they've got to somehow <coughs> make sure that whatever they spend money on is consistent with that grant. And essentially, they said, you know, you you could put the bike in path in, and you could still put the road in without having to have touched that TKS property. So it's not necessarily essential to your bike path project. So somehow we'd have to get them to link that.
that and say, well, it's parking for the bike path project. And so, I, you know, I, I, it, I can't rule it out 100%, but I wouldn't bank on it either. Donna. So you, I'd call it your number three on the back side of your memo. You talk about the easiest, the next easiest, mm -hmm. and a more complicated path is to subdivide the two into a smaller building space. And then you go on about then buying or selling out. I mean, I'd like to explore that. But I don't know if we have time to. So how much time do you think it would be to approach them about number three, that option is so more complicated? We've, we've got competing time frames here. And this is where it really gets dicey. Because states can have their own process. If we were to subdivide this, we need to go through our own subdivision process and do that to so create lots and go through our own development review board and draw up the subdivision plan and all that. We don't we can't just subdivide it like, okay, yep. we did it tonight. Um, and then there's, you know, there are existing permits for this lot. So anything that we change it to, whether it's parking or open park or anything else, we're going to need to get revised permits for that. So that's a whole, that whole sort of regulatory and funny, you know, funding source. At the other hand, we've got contractors who are saying, you know, we need to know what we're building um, soon as soon as possible, because we're going to order materials, we're going to be, you know, we're, we're coming in. Uh, fortunately, the timing of the, the winter is they've, they've got to put a, a storm drain in and that kind of thing, which they need to do no matter what. So they're going to get that all finished and then button that up. But, you know, so, so in the perfect world, we have whatever it is we want to do, all of our permits lined up and all of our, our um, finding source issues clear in time to tell them what to do in a couple of months. So, you know, it's fast. We gotta, <coughs> we gotta decide quickly. Do you think that's still realistic? I mean, my impression is that any of these options takes more time, unless we just don't do anything. Well, I mean, we have to do something because we've gotta build a road somewhere. Right, well, and so <laughs> in a certain sense, there's like, the, I think of it as like there's there's uh, the long term vision and then there's the <laughs> what's happening in I mean, I guess, May I guess <laughs> kind of vision. One thing we could do would be is just build the road where it's designed and not build the rest of it, you know, the parking spaces until we sort that out and then we will have at least done that part of it. And yeah. We know we've got a couple years before we have to pay that the other interest. So right. I mean, that might be one option. But that's going to put the road closer to the river than I think right. people want. Um, Donna, do you have anything further? Well, any modification of what's there to even move towards a little more green space between the bike path mm -hmm. and the river is going to obstruct what's currently planned. Right. And there's no way to just slightly well, modify what they're planning to do to get closer to this. Well, so it, it really. D it all, you know, this all works together. So, like I said, if we built the road out where it was, that's going to take out a whole bank of parking, which is going to create more green space on the river. So it's not, you know, it's not completely uh, changing that. The other piece is, you know, we Can you, I didn't follow that. Well, so right now, the, the, the plan calls for a road to go through, but then there's parking, I'm going to say, to the left of it, on the river side of it, you know, yep. a whole bank of parking. And actually, this whole conversation started with a simple request of, can you take out that bank of parking? That was, that was where we began. We said, sure, we can probably do that or might be able to do that. And now it has turned into, let's redesign this whole lot. So I mean, it, it's been evolving. Um, so if we were to build the road as designed and leave the rest open, then we could maybe fi then figure out what we're going to do with the rest of it. It would create more green space. I mean, I know ideally they'd like the road to be moved even further away. The issue that comes up is if, if selling this for a, a private use is in, one of the things that we need to understand is how important the parking is on site there. And I asked, actually asked Laura from MDC to see if she could research that have the capacity and talk to some of the developers and you know I did speak with the folks that were involved in the prior project and they said they could not have gotten financed if they did not have if they were not controlling the on-site parking 
And the other piece, which I, you know, again, we can accept this or not and agree with it or not, but the other piece is that the cost of building a new building requires um, someone to get top of the market lease rate just to get a return. And if we then have to charge people, if they then have to say, and you're paying to be in the parking garage across the way, on top of your top of the market lease, it becomes less attractive to potential tenants for office tenants and those kinds of things. Whereas they say, well, you got to pay, I don't know what that lease rate is, so I'm making this up. This isn't an official deal. You got to pay $25 a square foot, but you get parking, comes with it right there next to your building. And they say, oh, well, okay, well, that's worth the extra money because I've got this beautiful brand new office and it's convenient. So, you know, if if we're, not, if we're gonna hold the option open for development there, then we also wanna be careful that we don't do anything that is going to um, stop that, you know, impede that. So we're trying to, you know, have it both ways, I think, until we make a firm decision. Mm -hmm. so I, I don't have the best advice, and like I said, I'm happy to continue a process talking with people, but I felt like you know, this was new information from the last time we talked, and it was substantive, and that you, you all ought to kick it around. Uh, Rosie. Um, I had a couple more questions. One is, um, if we don't sell it for the full appraised value, are we on the hook for the difference yes. to pay back? Mm -hmm. so that In is fact, we don't really have that choice. Um, well, what I'm wondering is if, if it was a less desirable because we took the parking away, if it's a less desirable lot, somebody bids less money. Well, and I think that's money. why. I think do you, do you we know have to pay the difference back? Well, to the state. that's you know the very first bullet says any changes to the current plans have to be reviewed and approved by Vitri. And so they, they could conceivably say you're not going to get can't the money change that parking you're because you're devaluing the property. Um, and they have a process which they use, which we would follow for selling property. Um, and it, you know, they get an appraisal and they put it out at that and then they take bids. And um, we are allowed, I think, to have some view. We talked about this a little bit about what, you know, is it just highest bidder or is it somebody that comes in with a proposal for what they want? You know, I mean, if we bought it out, then we could make up our own rules. But, uh, but yeah, no, they're, you know, they're saying, yeah, this is what you, what we're expecting. And then my other question is, um, do we have the ability to put any deed restrictions on the property? I know we talked about it being more desirable to some folks that it be housing um, mm -hmm. rather than high-end office space or So Vitrians, so the, the deal that we had with Moat uh, and the purchase and sale that we had right up until closing day um, called for the city to retain the rights to have housing above the parking lot to, so we had the air rights to to build that, I mean, obviously not the city ourselves, but to negotiate that, as long as obviously that new housing wouldn't be able to use the parking down right. below because it would be. Uh, and so, and and the state was aware that that was in that deal. So, so that's effectively a deed restriction. Well, it was in that deal. It's not right. now necessarily, but they knew that that was part. And I, I believe that was factored in in the appraisal. That that is listed in the appraisal. That is a that and the you know the road permanent easement for the road crossing and all that is part of the value of the property. It's not just an open property. It's got public uses related to it. So I don't know if we can, you know, it's one thing for us in a private transaction to say that whether or not we can tell the state and feds we want to reserve this right, but maybe that would be a good way out of it too, would be to say, you know, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. Okay. Other than to say we tried before. <laughs> Further comments, questions? I mean, go for it. I keep talking, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I don't want to jump in on anybody else, but my feeling is that um, I guess I'm leery of paying $300,000 for a small patch of green space there. I am interested in, we've discussed all these other options, and I am interested in exploring those a little bit further because I think that green space isn't the only option. Um, and I think there was some public perception um, after that session that that was the only thing that we talked about. But I think there are other options, and I'm still curious in finding out what those are in the limited time we have. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure I can justify that amount of expense plus the ongoing um, lack of income that we would have from the property taxes 
um, for just a small amount of green space. I don't know how others feel, but that's that's for that particular option. That's where I'm feeling. <coughs> Jack, I received an email from a community resident. I think I think everyone did saying, well, you know, it seems like everybody's doing into this green space thing, and so it's a foregone conclusion. And so why should we even bother with the with the with the city manager's um, discussion process and my reaction was that I'm not sure that that's really true you know I I didn't see it as I'm all on team green space at this point uh, much as uh, I value green space I see the multiple public goods that could go here so um, given that this new information probably alters the uh, considerations I, I still think it's worth having uh, the manager convene this group to talk about it a little bit. Glenn. Um, I don't know if I can justify spending $300,000, but I really want to. And <laughs> I think that uh, I, am, I am definitely still on Team Green Space as much as I can be. Um, and I think that I, uh, I'm confident that there are a significant number of residents at least who are also in that direction. This is, uh, uh, I was unhappy to, to see that this is uh, a kind of stumbling block in, in the way of the, the plans or the, the ideas, let's say, that, that um, I already really got pretty excited about. And I can see that it does make it a lot more difficult, but I'd like to, to keep pushing uh, if if we can for for that something like that original idea um, I too am strongly in favor of green space and to me three hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money but it's a question for me of what well, one I'm gonna be a little selfish and say what I want my legacy to be as a city council member is creating a space in downtown Montpelier where everyone can be um, I know the pocket park is going away, I assume, because we haven't received any counter proposal from the landowner, uh, which is incredibly frustrating on many levels. But, um, you know, $300,000 for a green space that literally everyone can enjoy versus high-end, you know, commercial realty. I appreciate the need for commercial space, but we also have a whole bunch of buildings in Montpelier that have open commercial space right now, and we've had a hard time filling those spaces. Um, so uh, to me, uh, green space is the way to go, and $300,000 it is a significant price tag, but it's the kind of thing I think that will uh, yield a more significant social return than creating more high-end office space with prime parking. All right, um, well, so I'm gonna jump in here and say that um, I, I think, um, I mean, one of the things that I'm really hopeful for um, through this process is um, and because it's right on the river, I think there's actually a, quite a bit of opportunity for grants. Um, so, I mean, one possibility is that we might end up paying $300,000. Another possibility is that we might be able to find some grant funding. Now, to be fair, it is a tight turnaround. I don't know if that's realistic. Um, I, I agree that I think it's probably reasonable to um, ask the city manager to continue to move forward with this group and, you know, exploring our possibilities. But I also, um, like, one of the things that this changes for me is just thinking about the timeline um, and anticipating that there's likely to be, um, well, we've got to do something, <laughs> right, by um, when people are starting to construct whatever's going to happen there in May. Um, but that may not ultimately be what we want there, and that's okay. Um, so I guess I would just, uh, you know, put the ask out there that the crew um, consider what is the short-term and long-term um, plans, and I want to stay open to, uh, I mean, I, I I do prefer green space, but I I am certainly open to uh, if that's not the right solution. Um, like I want to be open to that possibility. Um, so yeah, go ahead, John. Well, I'm done. Well, I thought we were still going to be a bit on the hook for the the three hundred and 
whatever money we owe the feds towards the, the space that's not going to be the building. Whether we sell that space or not, we owe them the money. Unless we Correct. do something that definitely makes it transportation. So it's not just a green space costing us this yeah. money. Okay. And I felt the green space with some light parking at least would give us flexibility to still look at in the future maybe having a building there that isn't so dependent on parking. So I just I want that clear. It's not just the green space costing us money. We mm -hmm. owe the feds back because we have changed a use. And I, I guess I have to sort of separate those two. That's uh, I felt the green space with some parking and putting the road where this drawing had it gave us more flexibility. And if it doesn't, then I'd want to put the road where it gives us the most flexibility. And then if we have the two years to pay AOT back, then let's really seriously explore what we want to do in the next six months. Is that viable, Bill? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's viable. Um, any other different comments? Yes. Just to point out that it may not be the price tag may not be three hundred thousand three hundred thousand plus forty thousand dollars a year in uh, tax expenditures taxes that we might have collected from this property yeah. I think that might be high that okay. estimate that we got um, at least for the municipal tax we, again depending on what goes there um, the the building that was permitted we estimated would bring around seventy five hundred to eight thousand in municipal taxes per year um, and water revenues and well yeah we didn't, and, and additional water revenues and downtown improvement tax and <coughs> sewer and all that but but just in terms of general fund taxes so um you so know the, the number that we got may have included school taxes and everything else uh, is a higher amount but and it depends on, on what's built and what it's valued at so the, the permitted building was about seven can be valued at about 750 the cost of it was about 1.5 million so I think sometimes people say, oh, you're putting a one and a half, you know, uh, million dollar building in there. That's what your taxes are going to be. But actually, you can't then turn around and sell it for one and a half million. It's market value is something less than that. So. Um, okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Do you feel like you have clear enough direction? Well, I mean, I think the, the issue is you want to you want to continue having a conversation and that we're cognizant. And I, I, I mean, I just didn't want to call the group together if people's minds had changed. So. Great. Are we satisfied with that team? I, I encouraged the person who emailed us to get on this uh, good committee. We'll see. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. And we're on to the budget. Yeah. So are you are you have done that one? Okay. This will not take very long. Okay. All right. Yeah, go ahead. So um, I sent out information today. You do not need to know it or have read it for tonight. This is basically I'm going over what it is, and Todd just handed out the copy. So this is a very short preview of, I think, the discussions that we're, we're going to have over the next couple of weeks. And I'm trying to lay it out for you as simply as possible. And I think where we ended up was in a pretty good place, better than I thought we were going to. So basically, you know, we, we put together a base budget that you, you, kept our core functions, our direct services, pursued the goals of priorities, met our regu regulatory mandates, and kept our capital funding. Um, so what's in the base? We started um, saying, what if we just do the same thing next year? This, this year, same funding for everything, same staffing, no changes. And we actually, well, fortunately, we had increased revenues for pilot, increased revenues in local options tax. So um, those policies are helping to defray the cost of local government, among some other things. So to basically roll everything just over, um, it was really a less than 1% budget increase and a, actually a 0.3% tax decrease. It's pretty minor, but, you know, basically the same thing. If we do the same thing next year, it's going to cost the same thing. So we said, all right, well, what are the key, you know, what are the key elements that people have talked about? So we took a look at some of the things you told us. Now, one of the commitments that I know I personally made and we had, we had talked about as a council at least last year was adding another 50000 to the, the capital plan. So if you add that back in, because that wasn't in that, do the same thing next year. Uh, the new, adding a new full-time new police officer. Raising the Housing Trust Fund 15,000. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. The Housing Trust Fund request was to go from 60 
to 150,000, and that is a lot of money, but it's really broken up into three distinct portions. Um, the first 75 of it is a commitment we've already made to the French Block project. So we've got to have 75 in the budget next year if we don't do anything else. So we've got to go from 60 to 75. The next 60 was to retain the home, uh, first time home buyers program. The last 20 was to put away for the potential Christchurch housing project in three years with the idea that next year um, we'd have 150, we'd have 60 for first time home buyers leaving 90 save that. Same thing the following year, 90 and 90 is 180 plus the 20 is 200,000, which is what we would need for the Christchurch. So, so the, the, the request is broken up into three. So when you see our increments further on, we broke them up that way. Um, you all had indicated the ash borer was a high priority, so the team uh, included a full, uh, full-time position for trees for this next year, and those numbers include benefits in there. And then when we took a look at the facilities position and what we talked about, so we, we agreed that's a high priority. And we, we agree that it's going to be important not only for, you know, we're going to have a new parking garage, we're going to have a new transit center, you know, we're looking at a new potential recreation center. Um, you know, we, we have facilities, plus all of our existing facilities needs. Um, and the idea of implementing some sort of a sustainable energy plan. So when we do the full presentation next week, you'll see that we're going to recommend seeking funding and using existing funding to, to get a grant and to do, hire a consultant to do the energy plan so that a new facilities person that has something to implement rather than have, you know, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna be the person that can do the plan, they're gonna be the person that can make it happen. So what, we, what we've kind of came up with was, was, you know, splitting the baby was this is a full-time position, but if we don't start it until April of next year, we are only paying for a quarter of it now. Now that means we're basically adding to the following year's budget a full-time position, but it was a way to do that. Uh, so with those in, that brings us, those that add $231,000 to the budget and increases the budget 2.7%, tax increase of 2.4%. CPI for this year was 2.5%. So this was basically, if you want to keep your budget at CPI, this is what we would prioritize as the things that should go in there now. We all know it's mix and match time, so we'll talk about that next. So here's the mix and match. These are other things that we talked about um, as a group, not only as our own team, but from the strategic plan and from the, the discussions, we've, the budget surveys, and then the last meeting when you all laid out what your priorities are. So, the, and you can see some things are on here twice, and it's because we've, we've looked at them as incremental ways you could get there. So the first one was the housing trust fund. So that's the next 60,000 that we talked about for the, the first time home buyers. A part-time parks position, um, which would, again, we had some debate whether that would also be like we did with the facilities, that we wouldn't fill it till next spring, you know, for the, for the following summer. and have it be a full-time position or whether they would actually have it be part-time throughout the year. The parks wanted to not make that decision just yet. This is the remainder of the point of the facilities position. They get a full-time position that starts in July uh, rather than in April. Um, Art Synergy asked for $50,000. We just broke it up into two $25,000, you know, give them part. The full-time parks position um, that you see there, it's starred with the parks time. That is not two positions that would be adding to the part the part time to make it full time. So it would just be combining those two. Uh, and then the remaining twenty thousand for the housing trust fund, uh, Art Synergy. Then the remaining twenty-five thousand for them. Montpelier Live had asked for an additional ten thousand uh, dollars, and we put that on the list. Uh, I would like to do a citizen survey, the National Citizen Survey. Our pr proposal this year is actually going to be to take existing money, do it this year for 15000 and then this suggestion is you put 5000 a year away for, and then do it every three years so that you're constantly funding it and you're updating the data and the info on a regular basis. It's not a lot of money. I probably could have gone in. When, if I'd known we were going to end up with a minus, I probably would have just put it in the big. <laughs> um, but, and then the library funding that you discussed tonight, uh, obviously we made this list before knowing whether it was going to be on the ballot without a petition, so maybe we need to think about how we figure that out. So those are, those are the items that are in play that would be above. 
So they all total up to an additional 295,000, which is an additional tax increase of 3.1 cent percent uh, and 3.4 cents. So if you put all in, you'd have a 4.7 percent budget increase, five and a half percent tax increase at six cents with every, if everything was on the list. So that's kind of the, the field that we're playing with. So tonight, I'm basically going to give you this preview. Next week, we'll get you the books and the full analysis and some of the, the more articulated proposals. And then we have scheduled, it says January 3rd. I think it's actually January 2nd. It's a Wednesday, January 2nd. Uh, and the idea, that's an only budget. So I think you know we can get in there. And then the two public hearings, of course, which we can also do work on. And I mention this only because we do have full agendas on the 19th, and we will have agendas on the 9th and 24th. Budget isn't the only thing on those agendas. So really, the, the workshop day is the one that we really have devoted to it. Now, given the numbers and the amount of talk, you know, I don't know that we'll need more than that. And, um, so that's it for that. And there's one other thing I want to... So the other thing we sent you tonight was your way of looking at this. Let me see if I can find what I'm looking for. Hold on. No, that's not it. Uh, I'll, uh, we have these computers that aren't ours. So. This is that Excel this sheet, is it, right? Yes, the Excel sheet, and I want to just show that to everybody. That's not, I don't know who that is. Where would that be? I want to, it's on this, I know. Okay, here, here we go. So what this is, is just an Excel sheet, and I, I just gave it, what I just told you is all on here, and this is hard to read here, but you have it. So basically what this is showing you at the top is just the summary that I told you. Here's the, here's the lines that you have and the base revenue. So, and then the next blocks um, here are just giving you an example of things that are included in that base budget. Now there is one increase. I said everything was funded the same. The Montpelier Community Fund actually, they just came through with awards of 124500 That's up from one fifteen five. However, Last year, that 26,000 that was petitioned, those people all got funded. So that's up nine, but the ballot articles are down 26. So we, so we take that trade any time. Um, so that was the one difference. And uh, the other item is, of course, there's no zero for Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, um, which was another contributor. So, th so you can just get a sense of what's in the budget. Then below are the list I just went through. So you can see what those those base ads and then here comes the fun part um, we don't usually mix fun with budget yeah this right. is actually kind of fun. <gasps> that is really cool so what you have here is this is, is awesome. these are the add-ons and if you decide that you want to increase the housing trust fund you just put a little X there and hit enter and it's going to add it to the budget it's going to sh add it to the tax rate and show you and then the cumulative at the bottom and you'll see how currently the base budget the at this property value, 228, which is the median home value, it goes up $60. Well, now it's going to go up $76 because you added that. You can also add your own home value in there if you want to see or try different values if you're interested at what it might affect you at different things. But anyway, if you all you have to do if you want to add is put X's in here. So um, let me see. That's I'll and so that is the spreadsheet. So if, like I said, if you max it out uh, and then, so that allows you to mix and match. Now the other thing that you can do also is of course go up above and delete anything here if you want to take out. Um, you might want to put it on the side because it doesn't have that same X function. So just remind yourself that it was 50,000. So if you want to add it back in that you know what the number is, we didn't get that advanced. And, um, and obviously, if you want to take something out from above, at least make a note of it. And our thought was, this gives you folks a week to play with this and, uh, on your own and see and decide what combos you have. And next week, we'll do the full presentation, and then maybe we can just get a sense of where everybody's at by using this tool and then have then really sort it all out on the second. So Now, I, I have a question yes, on, sir. on my tablet here. This uh, synopsis is showing up as read only. Yeah, you can still. I, I so you you should still be able to do it. If you can't, we'll fix so it. So probably what you need to do, because as an attachment, it is probably read only. But then you need to like open enable. It with, yeah. Uh, either download it into Excel or open it with Google Sheets. 
and then you should yeah. be able to edit it okay. and to play with it. Or something. Right. Mm -hmm. it but better. if there's any problem, that would be happy to help out. This is my it. favorite thing. <laughs> Can we make this available wow. to the public? We're gonna we're gonna put it on the website tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. That. Um, so we we did discuss making it available to yeah. the public. So people um, can do the same. This is a completely unlocked version that you're seeing, right. and so the formulas and everything could be changed and tweaked. So we're just going to tidy up that presentation so we don't end up oh, with a lot cool. of different versions. But yeah, we, we weren't really going to do it as a game like that kind of thing, but it would at least put it out so people can be making it. Can be but it kind of is. It kind of is. No, but I mean, yeah. So <laughs> maybe next year we'll have a more robust yeah, it'll budget be better game. better next year, I promise. <laughs> um, <laughs> it'll get better. So, well, because you should be able to, but anyway, it, it kind of gives you a synopsis of the general budget. Now, what it doesn't give you, of course, is everything that's in uh, this, right? The top budget, the base budget, when we talked about services. And we don't expect you to take our word for it that it's just the same. So that is why you have these detail sheets. They're not the most interesting things in the world, but... If, if someone wants to see, you know, what's in the fire department budget or the police department budget and wants to know why salt is up or those kind of things that, that that's in there or the fuel, you know, what our assumptions were, we didn't want to, you know, we want to make sure that's out, out there. And again, we'll explain more of that with the, the budget book. Um, I'd say the other main thing that we want to, so that's really all we have to talk about tonight. We're happy to answer any questions about any of it. We're happy to... Um, you know, if you guys want to make all your decisions right now, we're happy to do that and be done with it. Um, and if, um, but more importantly, typically with budget processes in the years past, we've spent a lot of time with departments presenting their budgets. And I've actually pushed very hard for that because at least sometimes in the years past, councils weren't that interested in hearing from the departments. I feel like you all spent an inordinate amount of time sort of visiting all the departments and talking with them and learning about their operations and really getting acquainted. So I think in the interest of using time, if there are specific people that you want to see or agencies or groups that you want to see because of questions about these policy decisions or something you don't like you know, in, in the operating budgets, let's get them in and use our time wisely and talk to them. But it, you know, if you don't, if you just, you know, I'm picking on the fire department because there's really is no change. It's just same as it was. And so if you want Bob to come in and tell you about the 16 firefighters and how they work and what shifts they run, and I'm sure he'd be delighted to do that. But if at the end of the day we're just going to say, okay, thanks, you know, maybe we should use it more in saying, why do you need that extra police officer? Or tell us about those parks positions and tree positions or maybe weighing some of these decisions. So um, that's just my professional opinion. And that goes against 23 years of saying you should always talk to your staff more. Uh, but I just feel like you folks made a huge effort this year to do that, um, and they all appreciate that. So I think Connor actually has pending charges, possibly, or from an overnight. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's going above and beyond, that's right? right? Yeah, that's right, room and board. So if there are any questions, uh, Todd or I, and Todd really did a great job on this, putting the budget together. Our staff really did a great. You know, our, our we've, every year we do that budget group budget. It gets a little smoother, a little better. A lot of trust in the room. And we tried to reflect what you told us, but also um, we felt it was important that you saw a base budget at CPI. So that if that was anyone's desire, that that was a place to start from. Uh, so just for context for this time right now, I am, this is probably not the time to be advocating for what you would want, but if there are clarifying questions right. or, how do you or do uh, process suggestions, yeah. I'm just thankful for everyone that we did the approach we did and yes. looked broad and you brought us back. Very specifics and yet with broader options. Mm -hmm. I really yeah. appreciate it. This Thank is, you. This makes me very happy. <laughs> Marvelous. Yeah, I'm really excited about this spreadsheet. I mean, I know that's been said, but I didn't say it. I'm very excited about it. I'm excited well, to share it with the public. And so you'll all have great holidays because you'll have your budget books next week on the 19th and your spreadsheet, <laughs> and you can spend your holidays looking at budgets and playing with spreadsheets. And yeah, we can fix them up if you want more options, right? So I do have a clarifying question. Um, related to the uh, 0.25 facilities person, um, number one, I, I would really love to work in energy into the title of that because in that is why I'm going to support it. Um, 
So just want to make sure that that's really clear. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they're t you know taking care of energy or not energy. They're taking care of the facilities, but also the e particularly the energy aspects of uh, of our facilities. Um, so that's uh, that's not really a question. That's really just a comment. An order. Yeah. An yep. Order. <laughs> um, but uh, um, there is a question buried in here, which is that uh, I wonder how this relates to. The, I think we have a 0.25 position now. For right, and that room that's in right now, particularly if we're going to delay the hire, because that, that Steve's doing a, a huge amount of work mm -hmm. to um, keep a lot of our bids and processes going. Um, I, I'm glad you actually made that comment or asked that question <laughs> in a comment yeah. fashion. Yeah. Um, because we also intend to, one of the things we also want to do is have this person be in charge of the district heat system. Mm -hmm. So we we're very clearly on top, and that means not only getting new customers, but making it work and looking at all the options. And right now it's being cobbled together by our DPW. So we have a lot of facilities, and certainly the energy functions of those facilities are very important. But, but you know, you may recall a couple of years ago, the staff came and said, we just need help with our facilities too. Yeah. This, there's an energy aspect of it, but we also... Uh, need help and we're you know we're going to be operating a parking garage uh, you know with with automated systems and <coughs> financial collections and we're going to have a transit center right. and we, you know these are things that need, and if we do a, a rec center then these are all things that someone's got to be running sorry so can we come back to the so uh, steve twombly has a 0.25 position now it's contracted yes contracted it's not, yeah. so so that's still in the budget for next that's year. that's still in the budget for next year so this is sort of on top of for next year, that. at least, because the anticipation is we're not hiring till April. Okay, and, and so to, then and the, we'll be doing the energy the planning before then. Would be that potentially um, in the future we would. Put, we could that. combine those two yeah. pots of money. Yes. Okay. Great. That that was my clarifying question. Others. I don't realize nobody has any detail that I've looked at, so I don't. But if there's general questions about anything happening. Okay. Otherwise, okay. we'll get out of here before 9.30. I know, right? That would be amazing. Perhaps if there are further questions, you can just email. Yep. <laughs> and, of course, again, we'll, this will be on the agenda next week. And, again, I don't because we have a full agenda, it'll probably be another brief, you know, I'll give you a quick presentation overview of the budget. But that's... Yeah, the, okay. the goal is to send you into the holiday break with the documents, the spreadsheet, the ability to contemplate the budget process, you know, over that. But any feedback that you have, if, if just from this week, if you've already had a chance to weigh things, then it might be good to see where everyone's at, too, just so we can be running numbers. And next week. Next week, yeah. So great, sir. I don't need my skis. Don't need, need my snowshoes. Don't need my skates. <laughs> Got it all right here. You're all set. That's right. Okay. okay. So any uh, further questions about this at this accent? point, about the budget at this point? Anybody needs any help with the okay. spreadsheet, uh, yeah, please really call out. either so of us. Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. This is um, wonderful in many ways. So excited to have well, this we conversation. We were happy that the we charts are coming as part of this process <laughs> as well. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we wouldn't forget the charts. We use the Excel spreadsheet. It's totally going to be that person, though. So, uh, oh, no. The print is really small on these spreadsheets. <laughs> well, so you I've, can expand them. Yeah. I, I know, but not these. Oh, those. Yeah, yeah well, it's like a, it's the and I have contacts in, so I can't do the look over. Agreed. Well, the, the books you get next week will. Okay, good. We fix that. So it's a little embarrassing. My birthday no. just happened, but boy, it's clearly gotten worse. Yeah. Well, we, so we emailed it out, um, which obviously then you can expand on screen. That, that those are two things, um, and we do expand it a little in the budget yes, book. Yes, so. I can see it much better when I can zoom in. I just want to make yeah. sure that for the public who wants to read. Oh yeah, we I'm put, having yeah, a hard we time put that today. online too as well. Okay. And, the budget book will go online. Okay. And, and you can switch this to landscape too. That's right. It's really yeah. maximized yeah. viewing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, keep, keep in mind that we have 15 minutes basically to go oh, before 9:30. Uh, we have no other business regularly. So, council reports. Let's start with Rosie. Pass. Jack. Nothing to report. I will carry on and pass. Okay, Donna. Oh, dear. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> well, I hope you all got the draft that I left on your desk. Mm -hmm. And this is the first couple of pages are just offline. I mean, online, I just loaded it down from another city, things to think about. 
the third page is actual policies and standard statements that I found. And then the fourth page was the evaluation as we have it now. So I would just like you to look at this. I will send it out electronically and, you know, edit and add and mark out, but really get interactive with it. And maybe New Year we can attack this and get our own evaluation system going. So just for the public's benefit, it's a council self-evaluation tool. Yes, thank okay. you. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. it's a Carry tool. On. And there's been a lot going on in transportation. You heard me talk about the uh, Montpelier Infrastructure Committee is going to be having hearings about GMT's routes and the mini transit. They're also interested in the LEDs that DPW talked about on the downtown lights at the capital improvement plan. And there's just a lot going on, and I was surprised to not see you all out at the flash mob for the complete streets <laughs> on December 5th, but we went out with our flashing lights, and we stopped every pedestrian. And, I mean, within 10 minutes, I had hit 15 <laughs> pedestrians just on Main Street, dark as anything. And I got up by the library, all of them. The first thing they said was, oh, where's your light? Oh, that's cool. I should have that. Yes, you should. So really, there's... Um, John Snell just emailed earlier that a man, 74 years old pedestrian, got hit in Burlington and died today. And it's just dark, and we just have a lot of dark clothes, but we have to take responsibility as pedestrians to brighten ourselves up. We also need to be, as drivers, very, very, very careful. I have two people who are interested in joining the e-scooters, so I'm hoping that group evaluation will happen. Uh, one is from the Complete Streets, as one is from the MTIC. And also, uh, the f lots of positive comments about our flashing crosswalk signs. And I hope everybody uses them. Push the button, it'll make it flash. Thank you. Yeah, all right, just a few things first. I, I think at one point I spoke about uh, maybe a project labor agreement language. Um, as you know, we're building a lot of things in town. Um, and I, I'm always very cognizant that we're doing it in a fashion that's uh, consistent with our values as a city. Um, the, some of the PLA stuff, I did research in other cities, I think it could be vulnerable to legal challenges. Uh, so I have been working on drafting some responsible contracting language uh, that would entail paying responsible wages, um, participating in job training programs, and also opening us up to you know private rights of action just to make sure we're in compliance with workers' comp, everything like that. So uh, I hope to have language for you in the uh, next couple of weeks here on that. Uh, other things, uh, final scooter stats for the, the month that we had it. Uh, 2,245 miles traveled within the city limits here. Um, so that's, a, that's pretty good for a fleet. And the last, last week of that, as you know, was uh, pretty dodgy weather. Um, so we didn't get a full month out of it. Um, I, I think you could look at the first week there as being more analogous to what we would look at if we had it on the ground. Uh, it's not apples to apples, but if that was traveled by cars, that would be over 2,000 pounds of CO2 emissions avoided in town. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, maybe work with Sue on developing a survey uh, for the riders of the scooters there and really nail down how they were using the scooters to see how much of this actually replaced uh, you know, road traffic there and how much of it was just, uh, you know, kids riding on sidewalks without helmets, um, <laughs> maybe drinking a beer while they're doing it, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so we'll figure it out. Uh, last thing, and I don't want to steal John Sunder on this, but I've been talking to a lot of legislators. If we think our charter changes are a slam dunk over there with the bags and the non-U.S. citizen voting, we are sadly mistaken. Uh, I think these pass by such a margin that we need to be really good advocates for the city and make sure these get over the finish line. Um, you know, often a legislative tactic is just delay, delay, delay. We need to be ready to get over there and testify in the drop of a hat, because that might be how quick it is. Um, bring people who are affected, I think, tell the human story on this, and uh, make sure it, it doesn't get uh, le legalized to death here. And uh, I, I, I think we can get a pass, but um, it's going to be a challenge there. So I hope we can all work on that and encourage folks in the community to do the same. So. Um, I just want to put out there that I am saving some of my personal time right. at, uh, you know, from, from working for the need, you know, should you need at uh, the drop of a hat for somebody to go testify, just let me know. I'm into it. So, okay. likewise. Thanks. Yeah. Um, nothing to say this week except uh, 
come join me tomorrow morning at Bagheos, 8.30 to 9.30. Uh, the last couple of weeks have been well attended. I'm looking to get enough people that uh, I can just sit back and listen and not talk at all. Uh, <laughs> and, and I really encourage you to help me do that. So thank you. Uh, so I just have one thing really to report, which is um, the, the investment, pol uh, investment committee today uh, met, she was prior to council, and we are going to have a recommendation for you all about a divestment policy. So I'm pretty excited about that. So that's coming up on November, no, uh, November, January 9th. Um, and then, yeah, that's it. Okay, great. Um, well, I never have anything to say, and we want to get out of here. I'll make it quick. Um, the Monday before last, <coughs> yeah, uh, last week's Monday, I was uh, fortunate enough, um, privileged enough to be invited to a closed door meeting at uh, NYU Law that was put on by the, oh God, there's so many words here, Global Resilience Network from the International Center for Enterprise Preparedness. Uh, this is a group of um, a lot of folks from uh, Homeland Security, from the intelligence community, from uh, other election administrators, Secretary of State's, Secretary's folks from Secretary of State's offices and some folks in the private and nonprofit community sort of looking back on election cybersecurity over this year and working towards making a, a sort of collective set of recommendations for the next year. And um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was great. I was the only Vermonter there. <laughs> um, but I uh, just thought I would throw out that that happened, and it was terrific, and hopefully the report will be available soon. Great. Um, I think I've talked plenty and written plenty. Do we have anything we need to update? Can you think of anything quickly? No, I think we'll pass. Great. Okay. So then, uh, without uh, objection, we would consider the meeting adjourned. Ten minutes ahead of time. <laughs>